Act. management program has been running for over four years and within this period we've trained over 300 participants that have gained knowledge in areas of strategy, corporate governance, marketing, customer service and different aspects as well to make them to be better leaders, better responsible citizens to continue to bring about positive impacts across Nigeria and across Africa. The project really is designed to build capacity of young people who are running non-profits or working in non-profit and development sector. Another aspect of this project is what we call the Personal Social Responsibility Projects. Over the past five years that this has been running, we've seen several projects delivered across different communities within Lagos and outside of Lagos, where even our business students and our non-profit students get to collaborate and really create impact for the community. The board is very interested and involved in leadership transition at that level, at the level of you know, more well-established organizations, older organizations that have been around for 20 years or thereabouts, and have founder leaders who have been in those organizations for an extended period of time. And part of the thinking was how to support those leaders to transition out in order to create space for young Hello, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I bring you all special greetings from the Lagos Business School Sustainability Center. My name is Canon Otto, a sustainability and environment consultant, and I'll be moderating the conference today. For the interest of those that don't know, because I trust we all know, the Lagos Business School Sustainability Center is the umbrella body the host of the International Sustainability Conference. And this happens to be our eighth edition, the 2022 edition, with team building resilient systems for sustainable development. What a powerful team. It is the annual Dialogue to Action Forum. Dialogue to Action Forum. Just like um, our very own head of sustainability, or Reva would say, the conference focuses on real-time change drivers, real-time change makers, action takers, social reformers, and not just those that hope and wish that change should be, should be done, change should be made. It focuses on those that are really walking with folded sleeves and bended knees. And so on that note, I want to welcome you all, the real-time change makers and social reformers, the panelists, the speakers, the discussants, the moderators, the best practice case presenters, the management team, the organizing team, and our most welcome amiable audience. You're all nicely welcome to the 2022 edition of the International Sustainability Conference. This conference brings together stakeholders to advance sustainable development through business. And to a large extent, I trust that that's already happening. That's, that's being embedded into our business because you see that sustainability and sustainable development has moved, has transitioned, has, has progressed from just a topic for advocacy to mainstream, to, to becoming a yardstick, a benchmark for measuring progress in the corporate world. So sit tight, stay tuned, get your notepads, your note tabs, your jotters and pen, because this really promises to be insightful and most importantly, educating. So to welcome us all nicely from the management, permit me to make welcome our very own head of sustainability, 
in the Lagos Business School Sustain Sustainability Center, Orevo Atania. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Canon. Uh, and good, good day, everyone. I trust you can hear me loud and clear. I see all the introductions in the chats. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome from wherever you're joining us from. I'm just logging in and welcoming you on behalf of the Dean of Lagos Business School, Professor Chris Ogbeche. Uh, today, we're basically spending some time learning about this thing called sustainable development and how we can drive it through business, especially in Nigeria and Africa. But it's called the International Sustainability Conference because we want to tie what's going on in our context also to what's happening globally. I'm not going to take too much of our time. I would like to now pass the baton to the person who will properly open our conversation today, mm -hmm. Professor Enase Okonedo, mm -hmm. our immediate past dean of LBS and vice chancellor of uh, Pan Atlantic University. Mm -hmm. She's also a main leader in this conversation and action, serving on the board of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education. Over to you, Prof. Um, thank you very much, Oreva. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to the LBS International Sustainability Conference. I am really delighted to open the discussion today, um, and I would like to begin by sharing our motivations and expectations with you all. Each year, this conference brings together thoughts and action leaders from various sectors and geographical locations to highlight and explore how businesses can advance sustainable development. Indeed, this annual conference has grown in leaps and bounds since it was first initiated. And I am delighted that today we have over 400 persons that are joining us from 34 different countries. This year, our discourse is on the theme, building resilient systems for sustainable development. Now we have all experienced or read or heard the global impacts of things such as the rise in temperature, wars in parts of Europe and Africa, and even the recent flooding disaster in Nigeria, where 30 of the 36 states were flooded. We all have seen the negative impact on the livelihood, economies, governments, businesses, but more importantly, people. Now these problems in the world today emphasize the need for us to live and develop sustainably. Now, for some of us, the question may be, why do we need resilient systems and why should businesses take this on? We must understand that resilience is a characteristic that must be built within a system such that it will have the ability to recover quickly from failures, shocks, and uncertainties. And it is the ability of a system not only to absorb the shocks, but also to thrive in times of adversity and failure. And I'm sure you will agree that this thriving is something that requires concerted efforts to ensure that it happens. Now, people and businesses suffer more than was previously thought as a result of the lack of resilient infrastructure. Today, unfortunately, Africa and South Asia bear the highest losses from unreliable infrastructure. Natural disasters cause direct damages to power generating um, infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and I could go on. All this results in annual costs of approximately $18 billion in low and middle income nations. When we talk about sustainable development, this is about meeting our present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Now, how can we continue as collective humanity and sovereigns to thrive if we don't put systems that can stand the test of time and challenges, if we don't put in place systems that work for us as people and for our environment and economies in the long run. We have many developments and business goals to meet, but we have to depend on the systems, food, energy, healthcare, finance, law and order to succeed. The private sector is also able to innovate and move more quickly than governments. And therefore we call on the support of all of us attending this conference. 
Today, our focus will be on systems that work for food and energy security. Tackling the effects of consumer good price increases, disruptions in food and energy supply chains, flooding, droughts, financial market instability, I could go on. All of this require fresh and imaginative solutions. The private sector has always contributed to societal transformation by innovating to make social solutions affordable, bankable, and accessible. Yes, private enterprises make a profit while doing this, and they should, but not at the expense of the common good. So let's explore how this can be done again, as we have seen in the area of tech, hygiene, perhaps education access. How can businesses support the building of resilient food and energy systems, especially in a way that protects the most vulnerable in society and makes business sense in the long run? These are a lot of things that we have to debate, ruminate, engage, think with a view to taking action. So ladies and gentlemen, over the next few hours, I encourage you to stay locked on Share your thoughts and ideas in the chat box. I'm happy that a number of people are already commenting in the chat box and ask a lot of questions via the Q&A section. Also, have a pen and a notebook close by to take some notes and document your learnings. I would like to say a big thank you to the conveners, the partners, the speakers, participating organizations and individuals, but more especially to the Lagos Business School Sustainability Center team who have worked tirelessly to put this together and have remained consistent in holding this annual International Sustainability Conference. The 2022 International Sustainability Conference is officially open, and I wish you all a wonderful learning experience and fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Enase Okonedo, a leader to many, a mentor to many, and role model to us all in Lagos Business School. Thank you very much, and a warm round of applause to her. You can you. you can use the the clap emoji in the chat column. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Thank you. Moving on quickly, we will invite our guest speaker, who would be sharing a very important story with us. He has tagged it the Ethel story. None other than Simon O'Hara. With a warm round of applause, let's make him welcome. Over to you, Simon O'Hara. Thank you very much. Let me just pull up my presentation. There, can we see the presentation? Yes, we can. Great, good. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Simon O'Hara. No, we can't. We have to try that again. Okay, let me just try that. Can you see that? It popped up and went out again. Let me just try sharing it again. Excuse me. There, can yes, we see it now? Can we see it now? Yes, it is. And you can see me and hear me? Great. Good morning. I'm Simon O'Hara, Company Secretary of Airtel Africa PLC, and I'm delighted to be here today to speak to all of you about resilience, why it is so critical within our business, and the role it can play in the transformation of Africa. Airtel Africa is a telecommunications and mobile money company serving customers across 14 markets in sub-Saharan Africa. Our largest market, by quite some way, is Nigeria. And I'm particularly pleased to be speaking at an event hosted by the Lagos Business School Sustainability Centre, as we partner with the school to deliver the Airtel Women's Leadership Network, a scheme which provides internships and mentoring opportunities for female graduates. Airtel Africa is listed on the London Stock Exchange, and we are the only African business in the FTSE 100. Now, you may be wondering why a company secretary is here to talk to you about resilience and sustainable development. Surely, my role is more focused on governance or legal compliance and board issues. Well, yes and no. Let me explain. Back in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, I was tasked by the then group CEO to put together a team to develop the company's first sustainability strategy. The reason I was asked to do this is because the question of how we develop the company responsibly 
taking account of our impact, both positive and negative, on the communities we serve, was considered to be absolutely critical for our board and executive committee. It was right up there with our business strategy in terms of importance. Airtel Africa's corporate purpose is to transform lives and opportunities for people across Africa. Our sustainability strategy had to reflect this. So working with a team of technical experts within the business and specialist external advisors, I was involved at every step of our journey to establish our sustainability strategy and the long-term goals that will deliver it. What I learned during the process is that economic, social and business resilience are interconnected, a virtuous circle if you like. If we think of economic resilience being characterized as sustainable growth in GDP, and societal resilience being the inclusive development of social services such as healthcare, education and infrastructure, you can see that business has a vital role to play. But only if business is purposeful, responsible and sustainable. So what does that mean for Airtel Africa? Clearly, we are a company that is founded on a strong corporate purpose, but resilience both in our infrastructure and the services we supply, is absolutely vital. Delivering our mobile telephony, broadband and money services means we have a huge amount of technological equipment and infrastructure. Consider this, we operate in 14 countries across Africa, covering 600 million people, with our services being delivered by a tower infrastructure of over 30,000 towers and complemented by an extensive fiber network across the continent. We currently have over 68,000 kilometers of fiber, which to put it into context, is more than one and a half times the circumference of our planet. And often these are in some of the most remote parts of the continent, as we expand our network to reach communities that until now have never had the benefit of a telephone, quite aside from internet or digital money services. All that equipment and technology needs to be resilient to extremes of weather to surges in cost of demand, and to some of the other issues, such as civil unrest, when encountered. Then consider the service that we provide to our customers who rely on us to transfer money, operate their businesses, get vital healthcare advice, or access education online. It is essential that we are able to provide them with a reliable service, and one that keeps their personal data safe. So you can see, that resilience has to be at the heart of how we operate. Sorry, let me just... But before we look at what Airtel Afro is doing to build resilience into its operations, I want to spend a moment outlining how and why a telecoms provider contributes to wider societal and financial resilience. One of the key features that spans both our corporate and our sustainability strategy is that of network expansion. Clearly, if the business is to grow, we need to provide existing customers with more services and we need to acquire more customers. That means taking our network into areas that we have never had access to. Uh, that, that have never had access to digital services before. Rural and semi-rural communities in parts of Africa where there is little to no real infrastructure available. And what that means is increased digital inclusion in Africa. The World Economic Forum estimates that regardless of considerable progress in recent years, in 2022, a third of the world's population, some 2.9 billion people, still don't have access to digital service services. And that is despite the fact that 95% of the world's population resides within range of a mobile broadband network. Connectivity is now an essential conduit for information, communication, education, and societal well-being. People who lack the opportunity to engage with the digital economy face an ever-worsening cycle of disenfranchisement. So by expanding our network, we are able to increase digital inclusion which is why this is one of our long-term sustainability goals. This goal relies on, on us increasing rural penetration, launching affordable products that reflect customer requirements and developing convenient payment solutions and credit facilities 
allowing customers to access digital services as and when they need them. Increasing digital inclusion underpins all of our other goals, be they related to our financial growth as a company or our sustainability performance. It allows us to provide free digital learning resources to children who do not have the benefit of quality education. It allows us to access vital healthcare services for themselves. It allows women to access vital healthcare services for themselves and their children. And it allows people to trade. It enfranchises people across Africa, reduces inequality and contributes to more resilient societies. But it also helps support economic growth and resilience. Financial inclusion is increasingly recognized as a key driver of economic growth. And poverty alleviation over the world. To achieve sustainable and inclusive economic growth, access to finance is essential for a fair distribution of economic opportunities, poverty reduction and financial stability. Having access to a transaction account is a first step towards broader financial inclusion as this allows people to store money and receive payments. Financial inclusion of women is particularly important for gender equality and women's economic empowerment. With greater control over their financial lives, women can help themselves and their families to come out of poverty. They can establish businesses, eliminate their exploitation from the internal informal sector, and increase their ability to fully engage in measurable and productive economic activities. According to the World Bank, however, the gender gap in account ownership remains stuck at 9% in developing countries, hindering women from being able to effectively control their financial lives. Countries with high mobile money account ownership have less gender inequality. It is no wonder, therefore, that seven of the 17 UN SGDs recognize financial inclusion as a key enabler for achieving sustainable development. So once we have rolled out our network to new regions in our markets, we then work hard to ensure people are aware of our Airtel money services and how they can benefit from using them. Again, this is one of our long-term sustainability goals and our programs are built around three key focus areas. First, affordability, making sure we have products and services that are tailored to the needs and income levels of the unbanked and underbanked transaction accounts, savings and foreign exchange remittances, as well as affordable lending programs. Next, accessibility, making sure that our products are easy to use and available to those communities who need them most. And finally, awareness. Empowering consumers with the knowledge, tools and confidence they need to use Airtel money in a responsible way. We know that the economic activity of women is critical to driving financial resilience of a family, a community and a country. And in many parts of the developing world, women's work has not expanded beyond the subsistence level. Digital and financial inclusion turns that on its head and provides women with the opportunity to develop businesses, to trade and to lift their families out of poverty. It is a key driver towards gender equality. So I hope that gives you all a good idea of how the telecom sectors plays a critical role in supporting and expanding financial and societal resilience, particularly in developing regions of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa and also explains why two of the nine long-term goals built into our sustainability strategy are digital inclusion and financial inclusion. I now want to turn to another of our goals, service quality, which underpins everything else we do. Service quality is essentially the resilience we build into our network so that customers can rely on an optimal service whenever they might need it. We have a detailed 10-year delivery plan laid out in our strategy to ensure that our infrastructure is robust, our service is reliable, and that we will not fail our customers. Without this reliability, digital and financial inclusion are put at risk, and we would not be able to meet our commitment to provide access to free digital education resources to millions of children in 13 countries through our landmark partnership with UNICEF. 
So what does resilience look like? A key element is the rollout of, of new network sites, which increases the percentage of people in each of our markets that has access to our network. We have set ourselves a goal of 90% of the population in our markets by 2030. Also critical in ensuring we put innovation into the heart of our service offerings. Sorry, also critical is ensuring that we put innovation into the heart of our service offerings. This means partnering with equipment manufacturers to ensure we have cutting edge power efficient technology services. And also that our quality of experience measure, which is uninterrupted mobile service retainability, exceeds regulatory requirements and is maintained at 99.99%. Finally, it means developing an infrastructure that delivers reliable connectivity. We do this by extending fiber to our network sites and data centers, enhancing the international connectivity bandwidth and having a truly robust disaster recovery plan in place for all our network infrastructure. These are 10 year programs, but we are already making strong progress. And we outlined in our first ever sustainability report published just three weeks ago and available on our website. While all of this sounds very technical, and to be fair, it is, I think it is obvious why this is so important. People's lives, livelihoods and futures need reliable access to digital services. We cannot fail. And to provide you with the next example of how business resilience, in our case, the resilience of our network, can have an immediate and dramatic impact on financial and social resilience of a country, I thought I'd end with a brief example of a situation we faced in Madagascar, earlier this year. In February, a number of extreme cyclones hit the island of Madagascar, one of the markets we serve. The country was battered by winds with average speeds of over 120 kilometers an hour. Aside from the devastation that brought, that brought to homes and wildlife, the incredible winds also brought down one of our towers, which collapsed. This in turn impacted the radio network, and as a result, the availability of our services, services in the southeast of the country. In addition, breaks in our fiber cabling across southern Madagascar caused partial disruption of all international data traffic for several days. Quite aside from the disruption to our services, people all over the region were stranded with no way of contacting their family, friends or emergency services for help. It was, by everyone's estimation, a terrible situation brought on by a natural disaster. Because we had built resilience into our operations, we were able to respond very quickly. We immediately activated a secondary route into the impacted area to recover terrestrial microwave transmissions. We then worked with our peers to lease their line capacity in an effort to increase overall capacity into the disaster zone and to ensure the continuity of our service through traffic rerouting. To relieve some of the immense pressure on our technicians who were on the ground and dealing with the situation in real time, we sent out teams of engineers to the area and their support was crucial. Actually getting to the site was a major challenge as the area was only accessible by road and the journey would have taken at least 16 hours. As you will all appreciate, speed is of the essence in a disaster and 16 hours was too long. So we partnered with Madagascar's rescue authority who are running a helicopter service for people and aid in and out of the area. They provided passage for our support engineers. And as a result, we were able to access the impacted area, carry out the essential repair work, and restore a service quickly. This was vital for the community, reeling from a cataclysmic weather event and trying to contact family and friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon O'Hara, for that interesting story. I trust that's the that's the ethel story we we're anticipating. You made us understand your your company's robust disaster management plan from being proactive to being re reactive, and you you gave us a, a a real time instance with the situation in Madagascar. Thank you very much, and a round of applause for Simon O'Hara. You can use um, the clap emoji in the chat column. Moving on, and to reminisce on that interesting story, we will delve straight into the keynote address from the Chief Operating Officer 
of World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Geneva, Switzerland. And he will be speaking on building resilient systems in a VUCA environment. Building resilient systems in a VUCA environment. That sounds really interesting. And to do justice to that is none other than Rodney Iwin. Make him feel welcome with a warm round of applause. Over to you, Rodney Iwin. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm very honored to be here this morning and greetings from Geneva, Switzerland. Um, as already indicated, I'm Rodney Irwin. I'm uh, in my day job, the Chief Operating Officer of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, or WBCSD for short. But I'm also a Professor of Accounting and Sustainability at Lufana University in Germany and a faculty member at the Yale School of Management where I teach sustainability systems to the executive MBA program. So yes, you're quite right. Um, building resilience uh, systems in a VUCA environment is indeed an interesting topic, but it's not a new one. And at WBCSD, we have been talking about this for quite some time. Now, I'm conscious that many of you may not be aware of who WBCSD is, and I'm, of course, expecting you all to be able to say WBCSD by the end of this. Uh, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but we've been around for 26 years, and we are a membership-based organization bringing together many of the world's leading organizations to address the three big imperatives that I'll be talking about shortly. We are very much focused on business being the um, driver of change, and we also firmly believe that sustainability will not be met, the SDGs will not be met, the climate agenda will not be met without business being at the table and driving change. We are a CEO-led organization and um, we are very much in, in the space of making more sustainable businesses more competitive and therefore more successful. These are our current list of member companies. So Simon, looking forward to welcoming you on board soon. Um, but here you see are the large companies that we work with across the world. Um, these are all companies that are committed to the development agenda and who have signed up to WBCSD's quite ambitious membership criteria of net zero um, by 2050, nature positive by 2050, um, embracing human rights, and the highest level of transparency. Now, we started the talk about the, the VUCA environment way back over 10 years ago, and WBCSD member companies back then got together to actually start to say, hold on a minute, we need to start mapping out how we get to a more sustainable world. And the project that started in, 20, in 2008 um, asked some fundamental questions. What does sustainability look like? How can we actually realize it? And what are the roles that business can play in getting there? And this resulted um, with all of the companies whose logos you see on the, uh, on, the, on the slide coming together and creating what was called Vision 2050. Now, Vision 2050 proposed nine economic pathway developments that would create a shared vision by 2050. And that vision was nine plus billion people living well within the boundaries of the planet and very much set out a new agenda for business. And as you can see, it's set out as business knows West best plans to get from where we are today to where we need to be in the future and set out along those pathways, key activities that needed to be achieved. Roll forward to 2020, some 10 years after this original publication was made, while significant progress had been made, it wasn't going fast enough and it wasn't going um, at scale. So there was a need to rethink, to refresh. And so in 2019, WBCSD decided to revisit this agenda, this time to look at it more from a systemic um, transformational perspective, to understand if 10 years after the vision was initially launched, if we still need a common narrative, and if so, what could that narrative be? not to create something that a company just picks up and says, well, if I do this, I'm sustainable, but to start companies engaging with this agenda and using the vision inputs as key strategic inputs, as well as creating a narrative that could create positive and inspiring um, momentum for companies to embrace. 
So roll forward to 2021 and in March 2021, all of these company CEOs put their signature to the Vision 2050 refresh, a time to transform. And this is what I'm going to really focus on today because this is WBCSD's answer to business resilience and the creation of resilient systems within a VUCA world. So time for a shared vision. The vision that we set out in 2010 is considered to be still valid. We are still coalescing around this, this vision of nine plus billion people living well within the planetary boundaries. What we've done this time though, is really bore into what we mean by living well and what we mean by the planetary boundaries. By living well, these business leaders have said that everyone's dignity and rights are respected, basic needs are met, and equal opportunities are available to all. So it doesn't mean that everybody has a middle-class lifestyle with everything that they can get and consume, consume, consume. This is about creating equality and about a focus on the gross inequalities that we see in the world today. It's about ensuring that we have access to education, to healthcare, to security, to safety, to energy, and that we can do so in the most sustainable way. And within planetary boundaries, since the original vision was launched, we are much, much more aware of the science that informs the sustainable development agenda, in particular, the planetary dark boundaries framework had launched in 2010, 2011, out of the Stockholm Resil Resilience Center. And we know that in 2020, those nine planetary boundaries are actually accelerating in the wrong way. We are seeing that our use of fossil fuels, that our consumption of food and the impacts that that has on fertilizers such as phosphorus and nitrogen going into the soils, land aggregation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is actually accelerating beyond what was initially considered safe. And we're now seeing that five of the planetary boundaries are being exceeded. And let's face it, we're coming to the end of COP this weekend in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. And the 1.5 degree promise that we were agreeing around in 2015 is somewhat um, escaping us. So we do live in a VUCA world and it's without really much input from me to say that everybody on this call probably is very much aware of that. We know that we are living in a world where there is a high degree of volatility, whether it's political volatility, economic volatility, health volatility, we're also in a space where there is uncertainty, where the traditional way of looking at risks are what we call type one risks, which were very much in vogue prior to um, this millennium, where we could look at the past as a prediction of what was coming in the future are no longer relevant. We're now in a world of type two risks. These are risks which are not predictable to the same extent as type one. These are risks that when they do occur, can be exceptionally pervasive and can be very difficult to manage. We also are dealing with huge complexities. The globalization of business has been amazing, but at the same time, it's brought us significant complexities. We are seeing complexity in the way in which companies are now engaging with the development agenda. The regulatory environment is ramping up and we're seeing significant increases in the way in which regulation plays a role. We're starting to see corporate governance codes hint at where businesses needs to move away and boards need to move away from a shareholder primacy perspective to engage with the interests of organizational stakeholders, as well as pursuing the long-term interest of the company, making it successful and ensuring that this concept of fiduciary duty isn't seen as just short-term economic returns. And of course, we do have ambiguity because whilst we have nods to corporate governance changes, they still need to develop teeth. So at WBCSD, our work has resulted in what we call the three big imperatives, climate action, nature action, and inequality. So we're talking about a VUCA world. Well, let's have a look at it in reality. We all know that climate change is a reality. Well, there's 3% of academics who are still saying, no, it's not. But let's face it, the science is overwhelming. 
and that we are in a world in where the climate is changing and that ch climate change is not a risk anymore, it's a reality. What is a risk, however, is the frequency and severity of adverse weather events. Here are some examples of what we're seeing in the world today. We're seeing drought, we're seeing the polar ice caps melt and glaciers recede at unprecedented rates. We're seeing wildfires in Northern Hemisphere, in Southern Hemisphere, that are not only destroying livelihoods, but are extremely economically um, impactful in terms of the destruction that they make. And we're also seeing things like here, you, you see the water level in the River Rhine so, so low that the economic potential of this river was diminished. This is a picture from 2018. And large global companies like BASF, Solvay and Shell, as just a, a few examples, had to issue profit warnings in 2018 as a result of being unable to meet their demand and manufacturing capacity. Interestingly, these risks were not identified by those companies as perhaps part of their risk register. And therefore, there's, there's a need here for reflection on how our operations as a business are being impacted by the climate emergency. And of course, last week at the opening of COP, the sobering message from Antonio Guterres was very clear. We are on the highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. So in spite of knowing the science, in spite of understanding what we need to do to reverse the challenging um, climate agenda, and in spite of the fact that many businesses are impacted operationally by the climate agenda, as a, as a society, as a global human population, we are still not necessarily addressing these at the speed and scale that we need. Now let's look at nature. Nature will always win. No matter what we do, Mother Nature will always turn out to be the victor. So today we see this pan out in particularly in the agricultural sector and um, within the, the way in which soils are being heavily degraded. Around 25% of global land is so highly degraded at the moment that it is unproductive. 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, and this is 18.5% from agricultural practices and the remainder 6.5% from packaging distribution and process, contributes to this 25% of greenhouse gas emissions coming from the food and ag sector. But yet, of all the food that we produce, we're seeing that a third of it is wasted or lost. And yet people are still going to bed hungry or um, are in, in, when predictions are, are coming in of, of more famine, whilst in other parts of the world, again, this inequality starts to play out where people are over um, eating where there is obesity and of course that res results in the health crisis that some parts of the world are facing with obesity and the challenges that that presents. And I've already touched on the inequalities with, with, with uh, what I just said about the health sector and the, the obesity problem, but we know that people are being left behind. We still have way too many people on this planet who are suffering from extreme poverty. Modern slavery is unfortunately a reality, and it doesn't happen in other parts of the world. It happens in any country now. We're seeing people being trafficked. We're seeing bonded and forced labor. And you only have to look at what's going on with the, the plight of, of refugees trying to cross the English Channel to know that this is a problem that is now truly global. Child labor is still on the agenda, but of course, we also know that the capitalist system within which we operate has created amazing returns, but for a minority of people. And so we are seeing a bigger gap between the haves and the have nots. At WBCSD, we've taken the approach that we had in 2010 and refreshed it. Now looking at nine economic systems that this time we have gone into minute detail to identify the things that businesses need to really address. These are now focused across the systems that you see on the screen from the energy system, transportation and mobility, living spaces and all things to do with the way in which we coalesce around cities or also a rural lifestyle. 
products and material is vast. This covers everything that 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 companies produce, but has an emphasis on the importance of circular design, so that we can get away from the disgusting statistic that we have today, where of all of the goods that are are produced, only 8.6% are currently reused, repurposed, recycled, meaning that 91.4% are making their way to landfill. We need to get into that mindset that we need to not just produce and consume, but that we need to also reuse, replenish, recycle and repurpose. As was already mentioned by Simon, financial services and products need to serve all of humanity, not just those that can afford them. And we need to ensure that things like internet and energy are not something that people should have a poverty in. Now you need to be connected to the internet. You need to be connected to be able to do the basic living um, requirements that Simon was mentioning, to access healthcare, to access education, to access financial systems, we need to be connected. Health and well-being has also been magnified by the pandemic and also showed the inequalities that we see today between those that have access to healthcare and those that do not. And of course, water and sanitation and food remain significant sustainability opportunities as well as challenges. But as this is a session about, um, about the VUCA uh, theories, we have to therefore be very, very open about the changes that we need to capitalism. Even with the pandemic, unprecedented wildfires across the Northern and Southern Hemisphere, as well as, let's just face it, the recent US election, the debate about the future of capitalism has been playing out in the mainstream media alongside questions such as the conduct and responsibilities of companies in response to social issues and global issues such as inequality, climate change, and even public health. Capitalism and its consequences for society and the environment are very much in the spotlight. Even committed capitalists are, being, are beginning to argue that capitalism in its current form is unsustainable, both socially, environmentally, and potentially economically. Yet capitalism's core features of private enterprise and competitive markets are essential to addressing our greatest societal challenges and unleashing the transformations required to meet the SDGs. As part of our work of Vision 2050, WBCSD released an issue brief in 2021 that helped companies to enter into the debate along with investors and try to get them to address at least the starting points of how we can transform capitalism to a world in where more people benefit from the potential of the capitalist model. Capitalism needs to be reinvented if it's to create the conditions for long-term business success and the actions that business investors and policymakers can take today to drive this system transformation. The capitalism we need is one that re rewards true value creation, not value extraction, as today's model does. Specifically, this means that all social and environmental costs and benefits should be and must be internalized and reflected in the relative price of goods and services and in companies' profit and loss statements, costs of capital and market valuations. A reinvented capitalism focused on true value would lead to a world in which more companies innovate in ways that contribute to a flourishing society, capital markets properly value and reward inclusive, sustainable business practices, and as a result, more capital is mobilized to deliver the SDGs and the transition to a 1.5 degree world. And of course, the Business and Development Commission has given us great incentive to do that. And their report of 2017 clearly states that if we embrace this agenda with our capitalist model, but with tweaks and with perhaps in some cases radical shifts, we can untap 12 trillion in US dollars of new market growth by 2030 and create 380 million jobs. If we are to get to such a version of capitalism, we need to realign the incentives that drive business and investor behavior adopt new and better ways of measuring performance as well. 
A reinvented model of capitalism that addresses these failures will be characterized by five features. Stakeholder orientated, impact internalizing, long-term, regenerative, and accountable. Reinventing capitalism undoubtedly will be very challenging. It will require complementary action from business investors and policymakers with voluntary action from the private sector to changes in law and regulation going hand in hand. Business therefore has a crucial role in helping with this shifting paradigm. Business needs to walk the talk, adapting and aligning business models, decision-making processes, governance models, incentives, approaches to tax remuneration, reporting and accounting with a vision of capitalism that pursues true value. And it also needs to leverage its relationships with other stakeholders, from suppliers to customers to policymakers, and of course to civil society, to influence the norms and rules that shape capitalism as a whole. Resilience is a word that you see on the screen, but resilience in business has almost been a bad word in the past. We have been told that we need to be agile, we need to have just-in-time processes, but if the pandemic taught us anything, is that slack in our processes gives us resilience. And we have a lot to learn in business resilience from the resilience that the psychologists have been writing about for much longer. And that is how, as a human being, we need to have a regenerative and a resilient mindset. Business needs to get there as well. Systems transformation also need to take a, a whole revisiting of what it means to transform. Transformation means root cause change that delivers fundamentally new outcomes. We can't just tinker around and tweak what we like. We have to really think about, do we need to just rip this up and start again? Or do we really need to develop the courage as leaders to address this challenge? Whilst business cannot do it alone, it can contribute to and relentlessly shape the changes that we need in its own actions and in the interactions with other stakeholders. And we need to acknowledge the barriers that we have come to accept as the challenges for the future. We need to challenge our norms and values. We need to embrace policy and regulation. We need to improve transparency. We need to address financial flows as well as technology. And of course, we need business schools like the Lagos Business Schools to produce leaders that are not just educated in how to provide data, but also how to be human when it comes to the leadership that they need to deliver. We need to ensure that leaders coalesce around a shared vision, that they have mindset shifts focusing on resilience, reinvention and regeneration, and that they are system thinkers. Recently, the inner development goals have also been launched on the 29th of April this year. This sets out new competencies and skills and qualities that the leaders of tomorrow need to embrace. These are norms now around things like humility, empathy, resilience, understanding of, where, of one's bias and one's flaws in decision-making. And I would encourage you to ensure that your students are also being taught how to lead from the heart as well as from the head. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for transformation and it's time for this to happen at scale. Um, and I therefore encourage the Lagos Business School to embrace the development agenda like you're doing and make sure that your students are educated, as I said, with the heart as well as with the head. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really detailed speech. Thank you so much. I love how you dissected building resilient systems in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. And you touched on our two major sub themes, which is resilient food system and resilient energy system. And you broke it down to the nitty gritty. Thank you. Thank you very much. But you said something that, that really, really frightened me. And I'm sure it also sent chills down the spines of everyone that listened to you. You say climate change is not a risk anymore. It's now our reality. And to buttress that, 
you highlighted words of the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said we are, we, are, we are on a highway to climate hell. And we have our foot on the accelerator. And that's a new word to me. That's a new word to us. So we know it's been climate change all along and a transition to climate emergency and climate crisis. But now, climate hell. I'm very sure that's going to trigger everyone to change their ways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And to what are that done? Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And of course, I don't want to leave people feeling depressed or downhearted. This is meant to be an incentive to take action. Um, we need to take action. And I believe that the collective power of the students and the professors and the academic body at Lagos is making significant contribution to this. So take this as inspiration and not as depression. And indeed, it is an inspiration. Thank you very much once again. To water that down, we would watch a video that addresses resilient systems in the face of climate and social change. Let's stay tuned while the media team puts together the video. And that will be in a bit. Thank you. Apologies for the delay. Apologies for the technical difficulty information reaching us is that the network is terrible and the video is um, delaying to upload. So we'll quickly move on and allow the technical difficulty to be sorted out and we'll come back to that because it's a very insightful video for us to watch, especially in a forum like this. So moving on, we'll delve right into a very interesting panel discussion session that touches on practical solutions in system building, in food and energy. And to moderate the session, it's none other but our very own faculty in the Lagos Business School, Dr. Adun Okupe. Dr. Adun, over to you to introduce your speakers and moderate the panel session. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you uh, for this good Afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Rodney, for the speech that kind of kickstarted the entire session today. And I'm very pleased, and it's quite an honor to have such a distinguished set of discussants here that will be talking through the very challenging topic of 
practical solutions in systems building in food and energy. And why this topic is very important is because yes, it's you know sustainability is is, is key. It's good that you know we have this sustainability conference, but ultimately our goal as LBS is saying how do we really shape between um, academia and practice, and how are we also providing the light that can shine in the world so that people can start to re, you know rethink and reconceptualize the solutions that are not necessarily always as complex as we think that they are. So part of it is to say that how do we also distill this and simplify it so that it's seen as accessible and it's seen as something that we can get started on. And I really like what Rodney discussed in terms of the fact that what we're trying to do is not to say let's do away with the capitalist system because we already know that that's the dominant system and that's a completely different argument, but rather how can we ensure it works better, particularly for those at the bottom of the pyramid. And so what we're going to be discussing today is, is really looking at two key sustainable, sustainable development issues for many communities, particularly in our part of the world. And it also addresses certain uh, SDG, so sustainable development goals in terms of you know, access to food, no hunger, no poverty, but it's not just about access to food. It's also about saying, is it a nutritious food? Is it stable? Is it consistent? So basically, can people rely on it? And, and I, I guess, you know, they always say that, you know, you need to first of all eat first before you can think about every other thing. And so it also comes to, you know, can we also start to address certain energy issues that affect food production, right? So we know that energy affects manufacturing, affects technology, affects how we live. But can we actually start talking about it from the angle of food production and see how, you know, we can solve the, address the problem of energy and food security. And then really also talk about how do we make energy more accessible particularly as well for, for the bottom of the pyramid users, knowing that if that segment is addressed, it's going to also translate into sustainable development for all of us. And it's important because, you know, people need to feel that they are safe and secure. They need to feel like they are, you know, they, they don't need to worry about their basic needs. And if we don't, if we have more people worried about their basic needs, it also means that there are going to be more risks of, Instability, there's going to be more risk of crisis. There's also going to be more risk of discontent. And we don't want that to happen. But it's not only that, we also see sustainability as a sense of how do we enhance the quality of life and livelihoods for more people. And so joining me to discuss this very interesting topic, and I'm not sure that the time we have is enough, but we'll try and do what we can with what we have. So I'm going to start with Agatha. Agatha Anaji is the Managing Director of Geometric Power Limited, looking at an integrated power project. Good afternoon, Agatha. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Um, okay, you're welcome. And then we have Tendai Matika, who is the Manager of the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI Africa. Good morning. Good afternoon, Tendai. Good afternoon. And, and joining us on this panel, which is not quite balanced, but it is a bit balanced because, um, you know, there are more women than men, but it's okay, is Ashvin Doyal, who's the Senior Vice President, Power and Climate, and the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet from the Rockefeller Foundation. Good afternoon, Ashvin. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm in New York, so it's early here. <laughs> All right, so good morning to you. Wow, it must be quite early in New York. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'll start with uh, our panelists will give us an opening statement. Basically, just talk a little bit about you know what you do. And I would say that can you perhaps just say one thing that you would hope that you can you know share from, from this session before we go into the questions proper. So I will start with Ashvin and then we'll go to Agatha and then Tandai. Great. Well, thank you. And, and, and thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you um, and, and with everyone who's on the on, on this call, on the conference. Um, so look, I, I, I would just start by saying a couple of things. Firstly, you know, for, I, I work in the field of energy and particularly look at, at energy poverty and, and access to energy and how we increase energy. And I think we're at a really interesting time in the world where consuming energy is increasingly pivotal. Uh, on in the ability of sort of poor households and communities to lift themselves out of poverty. I mean, this is true with every passing day. Without abundant access to electricity, you know, underserved homes, businesses, communities really have very little chance of achieving a higher level of economic and social well-being in what is increasingly a sort of energy-enabled economy. Um, and then we have sort of politics of what's going on right now. I've just returned from, from COP27. Um, 
And we know the developing nations are not going to sacrifice their economic growth to curb emissions, and, and frankly, nor should they. And so the question is whether the growth and the innovation and the opportunities for uh, economic development are going to be driven by a massive increase in fossil fuel consumptions or through a low carbon pathway. And this, this really matters because at the end of the day, we all know that, you know, to, to, for the world to kind of go above a two degree scenario will be catastrophic. And that's why we focus um, and launched something called the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet last year, which is a major philanthropic effort uh, really centered around trying to unlock and unleash business models and innovations around distributed renewable electrification, the sort of newer solutions that can reach underserved communities. And there are about three and a half billion energy poor people. I'm not just talking about people who are not connected to the grid, but people who don't get reliable electricity, people who either can't get affordable electricity and therefore have their lives and livelihoods are constrained. Um, <clears throat> but we also look at, you know, how do you deploy and expand grid tied renewables and even looking at, in, you know, how do you decommission uh, larger scale fossil fuel assets? And I think, you know, rather than see this as a problem, there's also a huge opportunity of business and an innovation opportunity. Think about rather than thinking about it as an energy transition, let's think about it as an economic transition. Um, you know, we, we use these phrases like green jobs and green economies. So what does that really mean in terms of localizing supply chains, creating manufacturing opportunities in what we think is going to be a massive wave uh, in the deployment of renewables? Thinking about the ag energy nexus, there is so much innovation around the way in which energy needs to be made available in a much more localized manner to drive you know, food processing, on-site processing, irrigation, cold storage, local transportation, et cetera, and all of the jobs and enterprises that can be created around that. And a lot of that is what we focus on. So it's a real pleasure to be part of this um, part of this discussion today. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Ashvin, and thank you for just you know showing us a, a lot of what, what is happening and, and being as realistic as possible as well, because I think a lot of the time we seem to think that salvation or help is going to come from, from other clients who also have their own challenges that they have to deal with and they also have their own sustainability challenges. So again, so much to discuss and we'll try our best within the time we've been given. Uh, Tendai, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dun, and good day to everyone. Really delighted to be joining the conference today. So um, allow me to start off by sharing briefly about the Global Reporting Initiative, the GRI, and the work that we do, just for the benefit of those joining who do not know about the organization. Um, the GRI um, has been around for a number of years, uh, 25 years this year, and we are an international organization that develops global sustainability reporting standards. The standards are developed through a transparent and multi-stakeholder process and with regards to intergovernmental instruments. And um, the GRI standards uh, are offered for free, so anyone can download them from our website and they essentially support organizations of all types and sizes to be transparent about their sustainability impacts and um, to basically communicate how they are uh, addressing those impacts uh, on the outside world and how they are contributing towards sustainable development. And um, so now to the topic of today, I believe that uh, food security and energy security are entwined to humanity's well-being, economic growth and um, survival. We heard uh, in the news this week that the global population has hit 8 billion people. And so while the global population reaches new highs, the growth obviously poses more challenges for the planet. It poses challenges for agriculture systems, which will now be called upon to produce even more. And the challenge, um, as we all know, it's, is that what seemed like a limitless supply of natural resources, such as soil or fresh water, only a few generations ago is becoming increasingly scarce. And um, for a continent such as Africa, where the population is, is expected to boom, the resource pressure will and adapting to climate will continue to be daunting, especially for farmers in our region. And you know, they're constantly being forced to cope with droughts, floods, cyclones, and many other disasters 
which is why I think conversations such as today's are important because there's really a paradox in the fact that the ways in which we produce um, the essential food and materials that a, a growing global population requires um, can result in significant economic, environmental, and social impacts, uh, which basically put a risk to the future viability of global food systems. So I think um, partnerships are crucial. Um, it's important that we have uh, strategic uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships that would be able to address the uh, food security and how we can build resilient agriculture systems and um, how we can have multiplying uh, you know, collaborations that will come to the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals. I'll pause there and go back. Uh, thank you, Tendai. Uh, Agatha, over to you. Basically, just a, a, an opening statement, just talking a bit about what you do, as well as you know what you hope to deliver from from this session. Thank you very much again. I'm delighted to be part of this. Uh, Geometric Power is a pioneer power project developed by Nigeria and. Um, being one of the early birds, we've gone through quite a bit of experience that would be helpful to anybody in the sector. Um, it has required a lot of resilience on the part of the sponsors to actually get to where we are today. Um, reliable and affordable energy is something that is a primary catalyst in any country for its economic development. As we all know, security of the energy sector is essential. So we must have a mix and a value chain of energy supply that is well planned and it must be implemented with the best um, international practice so that local and international investors will feel comfortable coming into the country with their funds. So we must start by designing a responsible and sustainable energy system for the country if we are going to achieve the, uh, the sustainable development goals that uh, is being targeted. So for Nigeria, we think that we should have a pipeline of projects that have a good mix of alternative sources of fuel, especially the renewable energy projects, because this is what will create a responsible um, environmental balance while addressing the economic development needs of our country. The planning though must be done and implemented with detailed information and accuracy. A lot of places you go to, especially in the government uh, climb, they end up doing things in a haphazard way and at the end of the day, it doesn't work. So we have to have a resilient uh, system and people that will be championing the energy security issue for the long-term um, benefit of the people and the country. So for us at Geometric Power, we would use um, our flagship uh, project, the ABA Integrated Power Project to illustrate what can be done um, as a way forward. Basically, we have um, an integrated project which includes an, a 188 megawatt power plant. It's a thermal power plant and it's an embedded generation plant that supplies directly to a population of over 2 million people in a concessioned area of about 4,000 square meter, uh, kilometers. It covers half of Abia State in Nigeria. And it is well designed. We have um, partnership with General Electric, to, who is the original uh, equipment manufacturer for the power plant. The design includes a dedicated gas pipeline. And by the way, it doesn't have to be gas. We must find alternative sources of fuel, including um, the new renewable power for renewable power projects. So the distribution infrastructure that we have has been designed to be very robust. So we have sturdy stainless steel overhead lines, which some people might think is an overkill, but at the end of the day, you have to make these investments to make sure that 
they would actually survive the test of time and become cost-effective in the long run. Substations, et cetera, are also part of the project. Now, when we started the project, we were told that about our location only needs about 80 megawatts. But because we got into the field and conducted a consumer survey, we found out that there's a lot of suppressed demand. So from designing a 100 power plant, we ended up uh, ramping it up to 188 with um, opportunities to further ramp it up based on supply, uh, demand to about 500 megawatts. Now, for us all to make progress in this sector, we have to ensure that our projects do not depend on our governments. It's sad to say that governments in this part of the world seem to create economic crisis rather than provide support that investors need to actually make things work. So for example, in our case, we had to um, avoid going into the process of getting uh, the typical sovereign uh, guarantee for power offtake. Rather, we requested for concession of a territory. And that means that we've had to now deal directly with the power consumers rather than the middleman agencies created by government, which become political and unreliable as time goes on. We also ensured that we have a right of first refusal in our um, concession agreement, so that by the time the policy of the government was changing, we were right there and we were able to fight, and we truly had to fight for our Agatha, right I, to be Agatha, I, Okay, I, I know we have so much to talk about, but I think we will continue the you know we'll continue about your example uh, in a in a bit. What's going on now? Sorry, That's one right. second. Oh, okay. We'll come back to that. But but thank you for sharing the case study of what's been happening with uh, geometric power project. You know, whenever I hear geometric, I always think of geometric progression. And for me, the dream is hopefully that, you know, the sustainable development happens in Nigeria and in Africa in, in, in a manner that is quite accelerated, right? Because that's the, the need is so it's so prevalent and it's so it's it's so tangible and we need to do something very quickly. So thank you so much, everyone, for your opening statements and just sharing with us from you know where, where the perspective is in terms of what Ashvin has said in terms of COP27 and just also who's who's basically going to help us and what do we need to do and how do we start to look at energy. Tendai is talking from the example of GRI Africa and what they're focused on and how they also contribute to the sustainable development agenda and Agatha sharing a case study of what they have done in terms of creating integrated power in ABA. So just in terms of the format of how this session will go, if you have questions, please, you can put them in the Q&A um, box, which is underneath your, you know, the tab on, on Zoom. If you do ask it in the chat box, I, I might be able to get to it, but we will be prioritizing questions that are in the Q&A um, section. And if you really want to uh, ask a question, I think you can raise your hand. And what we'll do is we'll go through initial round of questions, I'll look at the time, and then we'll come back and see how we can also ask your questions. Please make your questions act as direct and succinct as possible. And if you can, also let us know who you're directing this question to, just so that we can move on from there. So Ashvin, I, I think I'll start with you. And, and this question is quite key because, you know, where we are in Nigeria and in Africa, sometimes people say, you know, why, why are we looking at climate change? There's so many issues already, you know, at the forefront. What, 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 why, is, why is climate change considered one of the biggest risk factors that's affecting the energy system? And I guess if you can explain that and then share with us some of your own insights on steps to mitigate against it, particularly in terms of what organizations and individuals can do. Thank you. Thank you. See, I, I, wanted, I, was, I was really enjoying listening to Agatha's um, story of what it takes to, you know, as an IEP in, in a country like Nigeria, and I, I feel the pain. Um, uh, but, you know, it's so important. Uh, if I remember my statistics correctly at the moment, um, there is still um, something like, with, is it 40 or 50 gigawatts of, of power being generated with independent diesel in Nigeria, and about a quarter of that power on the grid, which which is a, an equation that really needs to change. Um, 
Look, I mean, in relation to climate change, it, it is a really, um, I think, a really important question about we, why, why should we care, right? Um, and it's a tough question because, you know, we use terms like transition and resilient. Um, and, you know, you can't, you know, we're sort of transitioning in many cases from virtually no infrastructure um, to green infrastructure, right, um, in the case of energy. So when we talk about an energy transition in a country that's pre already consuming 10, 15,000 kilowatt hours per capita annually, like in Europe, uh, that's a very different proposition than when we're talking about transitioning in the energy system in a country like Malawi that's, produced, that's consuming less than 100 kilowatt hours per capita, it says, uh, certainly in, with only 11% electrification to start with. So what do we even mean by transition? So transition, and, and an attempt to address the climate crisis has to be based on a premise of economic justice and equity um, <clears throat> and the expansion of opportunity. At the same time, as I said in my opening remark, I think one of the reasons to care about it in the energy system is that there's, a, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of potential there for innovation and entrepreneurship and creativity to kind of be on the frontiers of a new economy. Uh, when you think about what's happened in the renewable sector, which is what I know best, um, the 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 level of innovation that we've seen, the 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 change in not just the sort of big price shifts of sort of PV and battery and all of that, but look at the different business model innovations that we've seen emerge over the last ten years that are still really just scratching the surface. Uh, the World Bank a couple of years ago pro projected that more than half of the unelectrified population in Africa would be better served through off-grid distributed renewable electrification. That requires a massive wave of local developers and companies who are equipped to be part of that opportunity. Um, but it also requires a massive public-private sort of partnership for that to happen because these are still um, areas of the world that are very difficult to, to serve on a purely commercial basis. Um, but the energy system itself is going to come under enormous stress because of climate change. And that's another reason we need to think about it. If you think about just heat and demand for energy, um, when you think about the demand for cooling, I'm from India. This summer, 900 million people out of a country of 1.3 billion um, so, you know, lived through 40 degree plus, and I'm talking Celsius here, temperatures, um, for 14 consecutive days. Um, and when you talk about heat and cooling um, and think about the impact that could have on the energy system, when we talk about air conditioning as a human right is the conversation happening right now. Um, what is that going to do to the energy system and what kind of energy system is going to respond to that challenge? Um, we are also, even in developed economies like in the US, we're seeing the impact of wildfires, for example, and what that's doing to system collapse. A couple of years ago, we saw, you know, massive parts of California um, where the electricity system had to shut down because of a localized, large, but fairly localized wildfire. Um, so this sort of cascading impact that it has on a grid uh, due to climate related extreme events um, is, is um, <clears throat> Is, is extremely uh, worrying and something that's growing in intensity. I mean, you go, I, I'm, in, I'm in New York and for those who remember about a decade ago, we had Hurricane Sandy and you know, for more than a week, um, the lower half of Manhattan was without power. And that's in the middle of downtown New York, right? So the system impacts that it will have are enormous. Um, but I think, as I said again at the start, the opportunity around thinking about how we transform the energy system and the electricity system in the face of climate change and how we actually address some of the climate challenges. I saw in the chat a question about, you know, how do we combine food and, and energy systems to address some of these challenges? If you look at um, things like food waste or you look at the need for cooling in agriculture, these have to be localized at point systems that deliver solutions. And that is not always going to be possible through a grid extension uh, kind of mindset because we, be, we may be waiting for another decade. So how can we accelerate the deployment of climate smart sort of solutions that are underpinned by energy systems that are localized, decentralized, and customized 
to different types of economic needs and business needs, you know, whether it's rooftop solar or solar irrigation or local processing, on-site processing to reduce food waste, uh, local electric vehicle transportation, all of these, each one of these is a business opportunity um, as well as a problem to be solved. So let me pause there and um, and, and hand it back to you, Adun. Uh, thank you, Ashvin. And honestly, I, I know this has been recorded and I really do think we need to trans Describe our session, um, Orava and Nameka, please, because there's so many powerful nuggets that are being shared here that I think that it'll be good for people to also be able to see. But ultimately, I, I would say that the key is what you've said, Ashvin, which is that the solutions need to be localized, they need to be decentralized, and they need to be customized. One of the challenges that we're facing, right, in Nigeria, as well as in Africa, is the sense of who's going to start, how do we start to localize, what about funding, what about financing, you know, there's so many things, but I don't want us to talk about the challenges now, I think we've started with the first steps of what we need to do, and then I guess the next thing we'll come to is perhaps how do we start to address some, some of this. And Agatha, I have made you a promise that we will come back to the case study because I think it's very, very interesting and very powerful. Um, but I just thought it would be good to also just run through some of these um, questions first. So, But I'm coming to you, Agatha, now with, with my question, which is continuing from what um, Ashvin has said. When we look at the need for energy systems, right, and we look for look, we need to see how can we do this in a local manner that is responsible, that is accessible. How do we start to balance energy security resilience, affordability, and responsibility, right? And, and I guess you can share some of the reflections and insights from, from your project. And, and then it would be good as well if you can also reflect on what this can mean for the, the agricultural sector, right? Which is very energy dependent, right? And so over to you, Agatha. Thank you very much, Edwin. Our project, which is the case study here that I hope would be able to assist people to understand where we are and what needs to be done, actually is a good example of that localized um, solution for our area. So Aba, for example, is an industrial city. It has a lot of local manufacturing SMEs um, that needed funding from the World Bank at one time. And when, um, the president of the World Bank visited, the only thing they asked for, not funding, the only thing they asked for was reliable energy, reliable and affordable energy. And that's how we came into this business in the city. Now, when you're looking for a solution that is sustainable, you have to think about how long it will take to A, develop it, especially in the energy sector, which requires a lot of time, for the development phase, you have to make sure that the people you are attracting to the table are willing to come in and make long-term investments. They're not looking for quick deals that will turn around and run out of the country. They need to be people that are resilient. Again, people that know what and are committed to delivering what people need in that environment. A lot of it, um, the success of such projects depends on what the government does, what policies they put in place, if they allow a fair and open uh, playing field for investors, if they actually improve on the ease of doing business in the country. These are some of the things that we need to see how we can either avoid having the government be the determinant factor or attract people that will come up with the solutions that will address our personal needs in the country. So going back to what we, um, to what uh, um, uh, Ashvin, sorry if I uh, pronounced it wrongly, what he said about decentralized solutions, we now need to see if there's a policy that um, we can work with agencies like the, the uh, water, so water Resources Agency to get things like the dams, mini dams, mini hydro dams that would enable the uh, agricultural sector to partner with the power sector to deliver solutions that would benefit the local populace. 
Now, for us in Nigeria, we have different climates. We have up north, the very dry uh, climate, and the down south, we have the, uh, the, temp the, um, the forests. So I would suggest that in this panel, if there are links that we can share with each other, that will be useful also to the participants, let's try and put that together so that we have a pipeline of projects that could come up that will provide a good mix of alternative sources of fuel, renewable and otherwise, and will help us as a nation to create a responsible environmental balance while addressing the economic development needs of our country. Now, I've tried to talk about a few things at the same time, so I hope it makes sense to all of you. But bottom line is, we must attract timely and ongoing investment in the power sector that would have a ripple effect on other sectors like agriculture and healthcare, especially with funding from the multinational uh, agencies and the private sector. Thank you, Agatha, and, and, and absolutely, I, I agree with you that there has been quite a lot that has been shared, but it's really also a challenge to us, right, to say that how can we start to share knowledge, right? It's important that we also see that, you know, you know certain things, actually know certain things, just even on this panel, we all have different connections and networks that can contribute to saying how do we start to aggregate knowledge, how do we start to pull from that, and how do we start to think critically to see the solutions that can work for us? and so. Today, this comes very beautifully to you, I would say, because a question I have for you is to look at the role of collaboration and partnership, particularly in seeing how we can cha champion a resilient food and um, a food, a, a resilient and secure food and agricultural system. And I have to say that, you know, I, I, I like the word resilient, but sometimes I think too much resilience, you know, is also not good. Sometimes you want it to be resilient, but it shouldn't always be functioning at that you know, that bandwidth, we want it to also function quite smoothly with little shocks to the system, but it's important that the systems we're building are resilient. So could you share for us the role of collaboration and partnership, and perhaps some examples of what you've seen that has worked beautifully from your work at GRI? Thanks, Adin. Um, so I think achieving a resilient uh, food production system is a challenge. And it's a challenge that uh, certainly requires some concentrated and multi-stakeholder action at, at, at local, regional, and global levels. And it must involve companies. Um, but, uh, business cannot do it alone, so it must involve investors, civil society, policymakers, academia, and others to drive that system transformation that's needed um, to achieve a, um, a resilient uh, food production system. Um, there must be transformation of the agri-food system and partnerships will be uh, essential. Smart solutions are needed and smart solutions I believe would come from collaboration and um, strategic partnerships. And uh, those strategic partnerships must be localized. Um, in particular, especially for developing country, uh, countries such as those in our region, Nigeria, South Africa, those are important. And I think both uh, Agatha and Ashwin spoke to this, spoke, spoke to having smart solutions that are localized. Um, those are very critical uh, to harness the power of innovation, the power of technology, and to mobilize finance, especially in, in the agriculture sector for the smallholder farmers. Uh, the, you know, it's the strategic partnerships are important and uh, they play a major role in terms of sharing that knowledge. So knowledge transfer, um, change in mindsets and production models. Uh, Rodney spoke about, you know, change in mindset and a shift in form, you know, just focusing now on reinvention, resilience, and regeneration for the agriculture system. So um, the bottom line is that multi-stakeholder partnerships are very important. They play a, a, a huge role in championing resilient food and agriculture systems, and they should be seen as an accelerator that can 
transform agri-food systems to deliver triple wins. So for people, for climate and for nature, uh, these examples, uh, you see there is, um, the Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe, for example, there is examples of how um, a smallholder farmers are part of outgrower schemes that have helped them in terms of export, exporting out some of their produce, and that that has been primarily through partnerships that they've had, um, looking at how they can supply into European supermarkets. Um, you know, and the looking at their quality, looking at how they can meet quality requirements and working as part of this outgrower schemes, this has helped and this has been primarily working through partnerships between the farmer and the exporter and looking how they can address the requirements that are coming in from regions such as the EU. So I'd say the bottom line is building partnerships is important, but it's also important to remember that partnerships are not easy. It's not easy to build partnerships between uh, multi-stakeholders. And that's where it's important to remember that it's a collaboration and it's also important to share those cross learnings. So having sessions such as today's where uh, people share, you know, case study examples, uh, you know, Agatha is sharing their experience. I think that helps in terms of um, sharing those uh, cross learnings and making sure that we're relearning and learning and you know continuously learning again. Thank, thank you, Tendai. And, and I, I agree with you, and I like that you said it that partnerships aren't very easy. Sometimes we put them as this uh, panacea for the solutions to problems, or let's just have partnerships. And sometimes people also need to know how best to approach partnerships. Not everyone needs to be your partner. And also you need to understand that there are different strengths that different partners bring to the table. And it's important to understand what are their strengths, what are your strengths, what are the weaknesses, et cetera, but also what are their own objectives and to see how these align. And I guess that's another session talking about how best to structure partnerships and how best to go to partnerships. Ashwin, you said you shared a very interesting comment in the in the chat box that I'd like you to touch on as you answer my next question, which looks at the some of the ways to address energy poverty, energy access, and inclusive energy transitions from a systemic perspective. And I guess perhaps if you can talk about the project that you're involved in in Ethiopia that brings you know the energy and agricultural sector together and some of the lessons there, and perhaps also some of the ways partnership has been approached in this example. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, what's what's sort of challenging about at least the energy sector, and we think about it systemically, and as and again, listening to Agatha's comments earlier, um, is it is inherently a public and private uh, concern, right? It is a regulated sector. Um, Policymaking is essential. Regulation is essential. This is not like selling shampoo, right? Um, and, and in that sense, you know, uh, whether we like it or not, the idea of public-private collaboration, the idea of partnership um, is sort of just baked into um, this. Because, you know, you made a comment and I, I was going to write it in the chat, but, you know, about resilience and, it, it, you know, as a concept, it's kind of double-edged, right? There's sort of resilience by design and then there's resilience by necessity. Um, you know, the fact that 60 million Nigerians have, diesel gen sets, that's a form of resilience because if the grid collapses, everyone has a generator in their house, but that's not kind of, that's not really the resilience you want. Um, uh, and so, you know, we need to think about system resilience um, in a way that really brings public and private stakeholders together to understand what are the most cost-effective uh, solutions that can be accelerated most quickly. Um, and that does mean, uh, to Tendai's point, building partnerships that are of sort of unlikely uh, collaborators coming together to try and solve these problems. And sort of, as I sort of, I segue to the, the the thing I mentioned in the chat was just, you know, when we were, obviously Ethiopia's had, you know, a really challenging sort of 18 months or so in terms of the conflict. But over the last few years, we have been partnering, interestingly, with this sort of center of kind of innovation in the public sector um, called the Agricultural Transformation Agency there. And um, they were the ones who actually came to us and said, hey, we need a, we need a solution on power. Um, uh, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, in the previous century, 
the, the kind of bottleneck to further agricultural productivity in the sort of system was really more around agricultural extension, the availability of seed varieties, the availability of the right mix of inputs, et cetera. Now, the next sort of leap forward in terms of agricultural productivity is actually much more energy linked. It is about on-site processing. It is about cold storage. Uh, it is in order to empower farmers and cooperatives to be able to sell produce at the time that makes most sense for them. It is about being able to reduce the cost to access, physically access markets, et cetera. And so the solution that they wanted was, you know, how do we bring affordable, clean energy into these agricultural commercial clusters? So it was not the Ministry of Energy driving this. It was the minister, it was an agricultural initiative. And so what we did was bring that conversation into a dialogue with the with MOE, which is the Ministry of Water, Irrigation and Energy, um, and started a joint sector project to look at how can we accelerate the deployment of, of, of energy into these commercial clusters, right? That could allow sort of scaling up of local businesses in the agricultural sector around different crop types, et cetera. And we then sort of brought, um, so we set up a joint sort of project management unit on that brought in, uh, you know, the multilateral development banks are always important in these situations. So the World Bank at the time was starting to look at a large amount of financing for distributed renewable electrification. The European Investment Bank was looking at bringing in some private sector funding for companies to participate in this growing opportunity and make sure that local companies capture, if you like, some of the business opportunity. And it's not all just fly in sort of international companies. And so structuring um, a partnership with a lot of um, you know, actors with different incentives and different perspectives took time. It took the best part of two years, but we have the first wave of on the ground sort of mini grids that are fairly large serving agricultural clusters with private sector participation and public sector funding coming in to de-risk those projects because they aren't entirely commercially viable. It is complicated to put these things together. Uh, and so that's what that's what's happening in, in, in the Ethiopia case. Um, so I completely agree. We can't get away from the question of partnerships. And I know that, you know, it's kind of like a catch all for, you know, yes, we must all work together. But it's actually true in this sector. It's absolutely true. You cannot do this without a partnership mindset. Uh, th thank you, Ashvin. Uh, and I guess from what you shared as well, uh, and to those listening, it's that these things take time and it's actually better in the long run to spend the time to ensure that the different stakeholders understand their role, understand their responsibilities, that you're also working with the right partners. And like Ashwin said, that you've really clearly outlined who benefits what, what benefits are also accruing to the, to the local economy and how are those benefits also going to be sustained over time to ensure that you are providing so, you know, livelihoods that can also transform their individual lives and the lives of the collective. And so it's important that when we look at the agricultural system, which in, in Africa has quite a lot of, you know, micro and small enterprises, we, we see that the power needs to come into aggregating. And there's so much opportunity there. You know, um, some of my MBA students had their project and one of the projects was looking at, at, at the agricultural sector, but also looking at processing, right? And, and over time, they, they actually realized that they were starting, uh, they, they thought they were starting an agricultural firm. And over time, they realized they were starting a tech firm because they realized that to process and to connect all the different, you know, and to aggregate required a lot of technology. And that was really the USP they were adding there. I mean, not adding, but providing. And I guess that perhaps for, for those of us here looking at agriculture and also looking at energy, it's important that we also see that there's so many ripple effects that can happen. And there's so much opportunity as to where within the value chain that you can play. But the most important thing is to be aware of what this what all this looks like. I would say that Agatha uh, and, and Ashvin have shared two very powerful case, case study examples that you can look back at and research and try to see how, you know, what you can learn from that. And then also then see how we can start to identify the type of impact that you need, because really it's all about impact. It's not just about, you know, partnering for the sake of partnering, it's partnering for impact, right? And I guess, Tendai, you can share with us 
some of your own insights on the role of impact assessment and also measuring because right all this activity is fantastic but how do you assess impact how do you measure how do you report on what has been done because sometimes well not sometimes all the times partners investors want to see your um, your reporting, they want to see your your measurement metrics, and also the, you know the, how how your intervention is going to lead to change. So, can you share the role of impact assessment and measuring in tracing progress and documenting lessons for sustainable development, both in food production as well as in energy? Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, so, I'm going to pose a question to. Um, colleagues that are online today, if you could type in the chat, how do you explain the impact uh, your organization has on the economy, the environment, and people? And then um, to answer your question, I think impact reporting is a powerful means for building resilient systems, both food and energy space for sustainable development in general. At the GRI, we believe that it's important that uh, organizations report on their impact. So, you know, look at um, where they're at, you know, both negative and positive impacts they have on the economy, the environment, people, including impacts on human rights and how they are addressing those impacts. I think that is the only way we'll be able to document lessons and be able to build resilient systems for sustainable development. I think the um, fundamental nature of both the agriculture and energy sector means that unsustainable practices by companies pose huge risks for billions of people worldwide. And this is where the role of impact assessment and measuring is very important because then I think once a, an organization starts looking at their impact and starts measuring, it places an, you know, an emphasis around the agency of sustainable development because then it identifies where the organization is in, in, towards contributing towards a certain goal and what the organization is doing to address, you know, the goal in terms of their activities as a business and um, with growing expectations from investors and other stakeholders for responsible business practices, what we're seeing is that reporting is important for, you know, companies are communicating much more about how they're contributing to the SDGs and you know, that then helps us to understand where companies are. We see more and more consumers worldwide wanting to know and trace back in terms of agricultural products where, you know, the product is from. So this then helps us um, lots of opportunities for growth in terms of reporting. And we're also seeing that um, policy developments, so um, impact assessment and measuring have you know, opportunity or present an opportunity to address the policy developments that are, that are coming up, uh, such as the EU Green Deal or the Farm to Fork policy, which requires, for example, action to reduce the overuse or negative impacts um, of pesticides or fertilizers or increasing regenerative farming. And so impact assessments and measurement and reporting offers that opportunity for companies to demonstrate how they are um, working towards addressing the policy developments, but ultimately how they are working towards contributing to sustainable development. And so with that, um, at the GRI, we have developed a sector standard. We do have a sector standard pro uh, program that looks at different sectors and how we can provide standards or guidance for organizations operating in different sectors in terms of the likely material topics for an organization to report on and address their impact. Uh, we have a sector standard that looks at uh, sustainable production on land and sea. So it covers companies operating in agriculture, aquaculture and fishing sectors. And it has identified 26 uh, likely material topics from that sector ranging from um, soil, living wage, and um, 
living income pro, uh, provision, the natural ecosystem, and many other topics that are available in the sector standard. And um, I think reporting using that standards then would enable organizations operating within the agriculture sector specifically to document lessons that they can share with other um, organizations operating in the same sector. Um, we had, and I think documenting of le uh, lessons, uh, lessons is very important because then it, pro it pro uh, provides room for um, sharing those lessons, but also room to be able to avoid duplication of, of efforts, especially in, this, in, in a specific sector in, 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 in a country. And, um, you know, there's, and it also provides the room to obviously share case study examples. We had earlier, uh, Simon from Airtel uh, shared how they're building resilience through their work in the telecoms industry. Uh, we have um, case study examples from example in the agriculture sector. Nestle has been documenting its journey to net zero and how it's supporting farmers across its value chain to transition to uh, regenerative agricultural systems and improve their incomes. And so there's many, um, I think, into basically in a nutshell, impact assessment, measuring and reporting is important. It plays an important role uh, for, for companies to be able to contribute to sustainable development and build resilient systems. Uh, th thank you so much, Ndai. And, and I, I, I like to think of measuring and impact assessment as a form of storytelling, because sometimes when you're on the journey as well, you 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 forget how how much you've learned, how much you you know how long how far you've come, and once you've built in steps to to track, you actually can see how far you've been able to come, and that also contributes to the storytelling and and lets you understand and see whether or not you know it's not just only about the impact of your project, but it also gives you the metrics to evaluate it in terms of how. It compares with other projects and in some cases or how it compares with previous projects so you also see how you're evolving as as an organization or as an initiative so all this is to say that it's very important and sometimes we 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 overcomplicate it but i'm sure tendai will tell us that you know the, the the gri is a very accessible and it is accessible way to understand to track and assess and it's also that sense of how do you report what you've done because one thing that is important for development as well is that we need to ensure that we're constantly documenting so that we're able to start off from where others have stopped as opposed to learning and you know starting all over again and going through the same mistakes over and over again and so even for projects if you're thinking of projects perhaps you can also find a, a partner that is very good at you know understanding how to set up the system to measure to track and that partner can also help you with your documentation and your storytelling not given a plug for the sustainability center but just just in case you know um okay agatha over to you before I go to the questions we have in the in the Q&A, and they've been quite interesting questions. And the question I, I would like to ask you, and you've already touched on it, but let's just talk about the role of government. And, and I, I hesitated a bit because exactly, but I know that, I mean, and I, I think it was Ashley in the study, you know, government is important, public sector is very important, but can we start to think about some sort of centers of excellence or examples from within Africa that we can learn from in terms of how government has worked hand in hand? And I, and I think your example is also quite good because you've, you've had to work with government. So can you share so maybe a few ways that you think this is how best to work with government and this is how best to approach government and how you can continue, or maybe something you wish you had learned before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've been through three or four uh, regime changes in Nigeria since we started our project. This, start, this project started under the Obasanjo regime and uh, it moved into the Yaradwa regime and then the Jonathan regime and now we're in the Buhari regime, okay? And uh, we're still about to get there, fingers crossed. It's interesting when you're working in an environment where the people that regulate the environment are saying one thing and doing another. So for projects like ours, which is a very long-term uh, investment that requires heavy uh, investment from all, all manner of partners, um, it's, it's quite challenging 
holding the string and trying to make sure that everybody follows through uh, to the end. So we've had experiences where some of our multilateral um, investors and supporters backed out uh, through no fault of ours, but just because of changing government policies. Uh, the regulator, for example, was changed overnight and then a, and a sole administrator was appointed and everybody was like, hey, that is not workable, that's not feasible. But what can you do as an investor? You just have to find a way to try and make your in, um, financial partners understand that in this environment, things are not exactly the way it should be, but that with time, solutions can come through that will enable you to reach your desired goal. Um, I talked about having the right of first refusal in our agreement. However, during the period of change, uh, during the privatization, the government still didn't uh, adhere to that clause in the agreement. And unfortunately, the human error that occurred during that administration led to about nine years of us having to just sit and try to unravel the, the, um, the mess that was created. So we're just fortunate that the way the project was designed, it's robust enough to have been able to withstand the very dark period that we went through. So how do you deal with this? First, for any project to succeed, especially in this part of the world, you need to have, again, very resilient investors, local investors who would not drop the ball and run away when the going gets tough. You have to have educated multilateral, uh, multilateral organizations or decision makers that understand and are willing to work with those of us in the developing world to handle challenges that are unique to our environment. People need to understand what goes on here doesn't necessarily reflect the individuals that are at play, or they also need to understand, and rather they also need to understand that governments come and go, but if you have solid support from your partners, you would invariably succeed because you are doing the right thing. And hopefully it might take time, but you will reach the final, uh, the finishing line. The last thing I would like to add on this, or one more thing I'd like to add on this is that in developing projects, we should always bring on board the youths, the younger generation they come up with a lot of innovative solutions. They are hungry for change. They are hungry for progress. So don't just limit your knowledge to people that are already in that sector. Throw it open. Have sessions where people from any part of the world, any part of the sector, any part of the generational chain can get involved get to know what you're doing and see if there's a way they can come in. So this idea of having multi-sector solutions that address power and address agriculture and address healthcare are things that we should encourage. Having said that, I think we're open to uh, having that database of uh, knowledge sharing and we'll be happy to contribute our quota. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Agatha. Uh, and I guess this, you know, these type of sessions as well uh, contribute quite a lot for people to learn. You know, I'm learning from your experiences, from what you've shared, from what Tendai and Ashwin have also shared. And like you said, how do we also start to have sectoral learning, knowledge sharing information and sectoral knowledge sharing databases? One thing that, that I, mean, I mean, as you were speaking, one thing that came to my mind, I would say, is that in Africa, I guess we have the skill of agility and adaptability from your project and from what you've shared, you know, funders leave because of a regime change, et cetera. But is that sense of 
we will have to find a way. And that malleability, I would say, is one of our, our strong our strengths when it comes to how we address development challenges. Because you go to areas that, you know, don't necessarily, you know, you look at it and you're like, how does this environment work? But you realize that people will always come up with strategies that help them to cope. And our work is to say, how can we understand this? How do we document this? And then how do we enhance this or amplify it, right? And so well done for your, I want to say for your endurance, not only just resilience, but it's also about the perseverance and how to endure, just understand that the goal is there and you always have to, to, to come to it. And it's something that I always hear from leaders around the world, you know, when you're having to fight for a cause or when you're trying to push an agenda, is this um, um, example of Sisyphus, right? That, you know, you're constantly pushing this rock up, up the hill and it's always trying to roll back and you just have to continue to do that. And I would say that that's perhaps one key, you know, one of the key attributes of, of leadership is that sense of not giving up and keep, you know, having to keep pushing forward. Okay, so we're going to go to the questions. I have five questions and we'll go through them before we come back to our closing statements. Thank you for a very excited conversation and discussion. And I guess in the chat box, I know some a couple of people have tried to answer um, Tendai's question. You can also just share some of what you've learned, some of what you're also going to apply um, from, from, from this um, panel session. And I guess also our panelists have brought out so many opportunities, so, so many opportunities that, again, if you want to key into it, you can also tell us and just say, you know, this is something you're going to look at. Even this knowledge database that we've been asked to start, you know, this partnership, this learning, et cetera, so, so much to do. And, and, and like you said, Agatha, it's a lot that young people can, can also be, be part of it. I was going to say young people like me, but I realize now that I'm no longer seen as a youth, but young people like all of us can also be part of it. Okay, so the questions here are, and I'll start with you, Ashvin. Could you just ask the question? She said, how does climate change currently affect Nigeria's economic growth? And I have to tell you, you know, I teach sustainability primarily to senior managers and, and business leaders. And they, that's the question they ask me all the time. It's like, tell me this climate change, Ajun, how, how does it contribute to anything? So perhaps you can share how it contributes or how it affects. And perhaps also if we don't take it seriously, how it's going to impact on our ability to have places to do business. Over to you, Ashvin. Well, that's a big question, uh, <laughs> um, and I'm not an I'm not a Nigerian economist, so I don't have that sort of particular data on on because I I know that there are a lot of studies out there that are looking at the economic costs of climate change, but um, you know as I look at it, um, there are probably a few buckets in which we need to think about the impact of climate change. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier the issue of heat. Um, one of the things that we're finding is heat stress and increased combinations of temperature and humidity are having cascading impacts on different types of systems. So if you think about the agricultural system and the impact that changing um, uh, climatic conditions are having on, on crop productivity and uh, food loss, et cetera, that's one measurable area of impact. Um, similarly, there's a massive question emerging around uh, worker productivity, uh, the ability to function at levels of higher heat stress. You know, we're already seeing adaptations in some countries where functions that were normally being conducted during the day are now taking place in the evening and night hours um, because the, the conditions are too harsh for human beings to actually operate. Then you have the whole world of sort of loss and, you know, and damage created by uh, climate change. So whether it's extreme weather events that create physical damage to infrastructure that has a real cost, um, or the fact that there are these sort of hidden costs, right? When we, again, I, I made the point earlier about resilience. I mean, resilience has several characteristics, right? One of them is redundancy. Um, and when you think about the idea of redundancy, it means you have multiple backup solutions. And in a world where you have more extreme uh, conditions, people rely on more multiple backup solutions, that's a cost. That's a cost of doing business. You know, if I need to have backup power and I need to have, uh, you know, a way in which I can have double, you know, I have to bring in extra costs for labor and all of these other factors, it's a cost of doing business. So look, I, I mean, I, I think there are several, there are several studies that I'm sure apply to Nigeria as well that look at it in terms of percentage impact on GDP. 
Um, but I think if you look at it from an individ- from a sector perspective or a business perspective, it's very real and tangible in terms of how uh, this is affecting uh, the 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 sort of bottom line. And therefore, when you aggregate that, affecting the economy as a whole. Um, I, I don't know enough, honestly, about Nigeria specifically to know where the greatest sort of stresses are in relation to the economic impact, but I suspect issues around agriculture, infrastructure, damage, and um, worker productivity are pretty high up there, just like in many other uh, countries in the developing world. Uh, th- thanks for that, Ashwin. And Khadija, just to also say that there are quite a lot of material that you can see online in terms of the effect, but as Ashwin has said, and, and just to direct you, that, that you know, it's uh, it affects so several sectors. It affects, you know, livelihoods. We have a lot of deforestation, erosion, and that's what's part bringing a lot of movement from the north for people to look for where cattle can graze. It's also affecting safety, security, stability. It's basically about resource, right? People are seeing it as, you know, affecting their resources, scarcity, and all of that. The side effects that that has, and then when you then come into, like Adriana said, doing actual business within the Nigerian economy, it's also contributing to the energy costs and also the impact of the energy costs. I, I can't remember the numbers, but I, I think that Nigeria burns, in terms of diesel generator, I think it's probably the second or third largest in the world. And just imagine just the amount of emission that's bringing, and then the health costs that it's also having, particularly in urban areas where people are dying younger. I mean, let's not go. Let's let's not go into that. People are dying younger. Ashwin, you want to say something? Yeah, no. I, was, I mean, you, you mentioned health. You know, we've been doing some studies on um, apart from the heat-related issue that's directly impact. There are all these indirect impacts, and one of them is around the way in which. Uh, vector-borne diseases are changing their patterns. So you're seeing, for example, um, uh, things like malaria, dengue, chikungunya, um, sort of moving up in terms of altitude and latitude. Um, so there's a there are projects. I mean, so if you look at the IPCC sixth assessment report, um, I think the projection is in a two and a half degree warming world, um, we will see another two plus billion people, billion out of the 8 billion, um, extra people who are vulnerable to this to those kinds of um, vector-borne diseases because of the changing patterns um, of how the mosquito, the, the mighty mosquito, um, spreads um, and, 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 and lives and flourishes, right? Um, now, calculating the cost of that in economic terms um, is, is, is is something that you know we're probably still just scratching the surface on but it, the, the health impacts are, are, are massive and so there's that sort of direct as well as indirect impact on the economy through health through the health sector uh, yes thank, thank you thank you very much for that Ashvin I, I've put a link to the IPCC in in the chat 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 box so people can also look and see and i guess that's also where places um, organizations like gri come in it's because how do we start to develop metrics that people can also see i know that there's so many measurement tools that exist out there um, and it's also that sense of you know because it's such an intangible how do you then also then make it tangible so that people can take it as seriously as, as it is and so thank you ashvin for the examples that you have provided okay so we have about 20 more minutes. So I will go to the next question, which was asked by an anonymous attendee to say, that says that actually this is before our session, but I guess we'll talk about that later. That's actually before our session. So Boyega Olorun Femi asks, and he says that the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, suggests that as much as 37% of food produced in Sub-Saharan Africa is lost between production and consumption. Are there available investment vehicles to improve cold chain to reduce Use these losses, and also, what do we think can be done to capture food waste? To be called okay. So these are three questions in one. So first question is basically to talk about, you know, the loss between production and consumption. A lot of that has to do with processing, right, and storage before it gets to and transportation. So processing, storage, and transportation because before it gets to consumption, and we just don't have enough interventions across that value chain. That answers that. Second question, which I guess I'll put through to. Well, any of the panelists can let me know is, do you, do you know of any in available investment vehicles that can improve cold chain? And then what approach do you think can be used to capture food waste to convert it to energy 
And then how do we, and is it possible? Yes, the answer is it's possible because a lot of these losses are incurred by players in the informal sector. So Boyga, I've answered two of your questions and I guess the panelists can answer what we think can be done to transform food waste, so waste to energy. Okay, sorry, one second. I've been told that people can ask their questions audibly. Yes, I, I did say that if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand too. So please, if you raise your hand, I will call on you. But I think we can answer Guega's question. So Agatha, Tendai, Ashvin, who wants to take what question? So waste to energy is the question here, really. So food waste to energy. Anybody? There are a lot, there is, I, I'll just jump in quickly. There, there are several proven technologies on waste to energy, not necessarily food waste, but also other types of agricultural sort of residue, uh, biomass, et cetera. We are in, in one of our projects that we invest in in India um, in collaboration with Tata Power, uh, which is a big part of a big conglomerate in India. Um, there is a, uh, they have a mini grid um, program uh, business line, which has about currently about 250 operating mini grids. And they even those solar mini grids have a backup, um, which is currently diesel in many cases, right? Because, you know, otherwise, as you try to balance a system, you know, without getting too wonky about it, the, the sort of battery prices are still quite high. And so if you want to have 24 seven solar, the cost of battery is so high that you need some sort of a backup. So Tata have been doing some really interesting work on you know, in basically displacing the diesel backup with bio waste, bio, it's essentially a biomethane um, production process um, so that they can reduce the cost and they're getting a, you know, a, they're, they're going to have a, they're working with an independent company that is going to create these biomethane hubs um, and they're getting, um, and they, they essentially have a purchasing contract with them. So it's an OPEX operation rather than a CAPEX operation. And so there is this sort of waste to energy, biomass to energy ecosystem out there that I think um, is, is, is important and exciting. But I think from a, if we look at it from a food waste perspective, you know, I'm, I, I think you have to also ask the question is like, what, is the ups, what, are, what are the better upstream solutions to that than the conversion of waste to energy, right? Um, why let's ask the question on the production side why do we have the levels of food waste that we have 30 35 40 percent varies a little bit across different crops but on average we hear numbers of 30 to 40 percent right uh what is going on in the incentive structure um in on-site processing and cold storage uh that is and pricing structures of food which has actually historically been underpriced um that is leading to the level of waste uh, uh, that, that we're seeing in our, in our food system. And that's, to me, a, a really critical question we need to address. Then when you say that once you've done everything to reduce food waste, is there a waste to energy solution on top of that that should be pursued? Absolutely. Um, but I think we have to stop. We, you know, we, are, we are fast approaching a 9 billion planet, and we are already producing enough food to feed 10 billion people. But we're flushing three or four billion people's worth of food away, um, which is just a shocking reality, right? It just in a, in a in a system where we're trying to create environmental sustainability, the fact that there is thirty to forty percent food waste to me is just a tragedy um, that we have to think about multiple solutions for. And waste to energy could be one of those solutions. Uh, it, yes, and Ashvin, I completely agree with you, and I would say that. It's also, you know, I was on a keynote panel with Rodney, actually, I think last week in Amsterdam, and it was looking at, you know, some of the things around the circular economy as well to say, how are we designing the systems that are, you know, that are affecting food production? And so, and it's not just food production, even in architecture, they also have about 30% of waste in terms of what goes onto site and what is taken out, out of site. And so can we start to think about things also from a circular economy perspective? So Boyga, you can see quite a lot of information already on online there. But one thing I would like to add that I, I mentioned there as well is that 
I feel like we need to also question ourselves in terms of how we consume, because the waste doesn't only happen between production and consumption. Also, when you go to you know, the supermarkets, the restaurants, et cetera. So how are we also, and even homes, right? You see so much that isn't consumed. So can we also look at responsible consumption and see how we can reduce? If you don't need something, then perhaps you'd also see how you can make it available to someone that needs it, right? As opposed to letting it become waste, which is what I guess Ashwin is saying. How do we even reduce the volume of waste before we then, because that would also affect how much we have to convert and, and energy is also being used, right, in terms of these conversions. So we need to be as efficient as possible. And I guess that, that those are some ways we, we, we also need, need to think about it. Agatha, I'm going to come to you before I answer the final question, which is by Dio. And Agatha, the question is, what's the interest of geometric power in providing power Okay, in providing power to power cold chain in order to reduce food losses and strengthen food systems. Well, I think geometric power is an integrated power project, right? And it's looking at providing power. But can perhaps can you share some of what you're doing, not necessarily for cold chain, but also to look at how do we strengthen the energy system and what are your plans for the future, if you can share some of that? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Geometric power wants to actually get into the uh, renewable energy space. Um, but I would like to take one quick moment and um, refer our last uh, inquirer to the Songhai Farms. I don't know if you've heard about Songhai Farms. It's an integrated farming um, organization uh, that's promoting organic farming, uh, natural resources, protecting the environment, and using um, organic waste to generate energy. So it is something that can be replicated in any part of Africa or the world for that matter. So I would suggest that um, our participants that are interested uh, look that up and contact them for, for more information on how we can utilize uh, organic waste for uh, generation of energy. So um, to your question, yes, uh, Geometric Power is very keen on um, addressing some of these issues, but we're still trying to get out of where we are and uh, make sure that this project, the ABA Integrated Project actually succeeds. Uh, we've come a long way and uh, having recently taken over the ring fence, we are now kind of uh, breathing a little easier. And we're now developing uh, still early stages, um, a mini hydro project that's located in a local community that would benefit from the agricultural aspect of uh, agricultural aspect of the project, as well as um, empowerment of the youth and women in the community to ensure that they have uh, food security and energy to um, add value, to help them add value to the agricultural products. So that project is something that is very dear to our hearts, uh, the hearts of the sponsors. And I'm hoping that in another couple of years, we'll actually be able to share a success story on that with you guys. Uh. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Agatha. And, and I guess I have a final question. Well, not, not a question, a comment from Dayo Ajayobe, who says that excellent the energy initiative undertaken and seeing how it can be translated around the country. It has been well thought out and we look forward to seeing the economic outcomes. And I guess this is a thing, right? It takes time. So anything worth doing takes a lot of time. And you know, it's better to be as patient as possible to ensure you do it well before trying to replicated you know, throughout the country or throughout other spaces. And sometimes it's that patience that we don't have. And what it means is that we don't just wait to see what can work well, but we're piloting and also piloting errors. So there's something to do with focusing on certain things and finishing it and then moving on to the next. Okay, so I think those are the questions. If I don't have any more questions, is that correct? Anybody else have any questions before I go to my panelists for their final round of comments before we close? Okay, we don't have any questions. So um, Tendai, I, I want to come to you because I think that when people hear measurement, 
assessment, reporting, the switch off. Um, can we, can you, what can you share with us here on just in terms of how to start to address reporting from a, you know, from a position, not only of responsibility, but also a position of learning and knowledge sharing. So you've already shared with us why it's important and the impact, et cetera. But I know that there is still some reluctance, right? Because sometimes people think, oh, this is just for the multinational organizations or for the large companies that have large governments that require funding and government projects, et cetera. But can we make a case here for the, you know, the individual people, you know, the individual projects, the smaller projects, right? The projects that young people are going to come into and working with different people. Why should they also take reporting seriously? Thanks, Adun. And um, I think it's important to mention that reporting is a journey and uh, it's not about the report. You know, the report is just an end to that. You know, it's just part of the process. I think what's important is really the process. Um, the process, you know, helps organizations, be it large multinationals or even the smaller organizations that are looking to start out. It really helps in terms of identifying your risks. So it's part of the risk management of your business. And once you identify your risks, then you look at how you can put systems in place to manage those risks. So, you know, there's this famous uh, saying that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So I think the report, reporting must be really about, it's really about the process and it's not, really, it's not solemnly about disclosing positive impacts. It's really about both the positive and the negative impacts because then that gives a full picture of the company's um, activities and where the company is in terms of preventing or mitigating uh, negative impacts and how it's looking at, you know, further building onto its uh, positive impacts. So I think what's crucial to mention is that it is a journey. It's not, it, it, you know, the, the benefit is in the process of putting together that report because that's when you identify you know where your organization is what systems you need to put in place and you know what learnings you can take from the other organizations in your sector that are reporting and how you can further build your business and open new opportunities for your business uh, thanks, Sendai. And just a follow-up question. Is there any resource they can find online from GRI that can help them with getting started? And can you share some of this? Yes, so certainly there's lots of resources. Um, I think I mentioned at the beginning that the GRI uh, sustainability reporting standards are a free public good. So anyone can go onto our website and you know download the standards and go through them and start using them for their reporting journey, as well as many other resources that we have put uh, out um, to assist organizations in their reporting journey. So we have resources looking at how SMEs can start their reporting journey, what the benefits are for SMEs, and we also have resources and how you know organizations can integrate the SDGs as part of their strategy and how they can use the GRI standards to report on their contributions to the SDGs. So they, um, if you go into a website, I'll, I'll paste in the chat a number of links that we, you know, where resources can be found. And these are all free resources that are available for individuals or organizations that are looking to start their reporting journey or just better understand what the importance of impact measurement and reporting is. Uh, th th thank you for that, actually, um, Tendai. And next week, I, I will be speaking actually at, at the Institute of Directors and looking at corporate governance and the role of the board in terms of, you know, looking at sustainability. And part of these questions is also this sense of measurement and reporting. So it's, it's, it's something that goes across the board, right, from entry level also to leadership. And I think that if more of us start that journey now and start getting used to it more, by the time we get to board level and leadership positions, it's easier for us to be able to say, okay, this works, this doesn't work, and this is how best to do it. Right, Ashwin, my, my request from you for your closing statement really is to see, you know, I know you've done quite a lot of work in Asia in the past, and you've done quite a bit in Africa as well. I know that there are so many lessons that you have learned from, from, from Asia, that, that some of which you have shared here, but just one thing that you think we all need to start thinking about now, if you can share that as your closing statements, and, and Agatha coming to you, sorry, Ashwin, you haven't had as much time to prepare as Agatha, but that sense of one thing you think that we can learn and where we can also start to direct our, you know, inquiry to, to, to start learning from what Asia has, has succeeded well. Um, perhaps you can share that with, with us. 
And I know there are many things, right? But yes, maybe one thing. Yeah, gosh, that is, you're making this, it's a hard, hard work early in the morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind, which may not be the right thing, um, is I think what we've seen in, in Asia, and I, I would say particularly in India, um, is a lot of hard work that com smaller companies have done to kind of find the innovation pathway into some of these difficult areas. So, you know, we work with about six or seven developers um, in India that are really scaling up off-grid electrification businesses um, and have, you know, kind of, we, we talked earlier about like kind of, we have this term in, in Hindi called jugad, which is a form of like local innovation, like just being able to kind of figure things out, right, in, in, in the context of a messy policy environment and all of that, a little bit like how Agatha was describing. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from that process because my big worry in 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 the case of Africa is that and maybe not so much in Nigeria but in certainly in East Africa and elsewhere is that you know you have a lot of kind of well-intentioned sort of overseas international western companies coming in and trying to sort of crack this space and I don't think that's sustainable um, and I just don't think it's going to ultimately drive scale across multiple countries. And so if there's a way of learning from and sharing with what local companies have started to do and achieve in a place like India, and how can some of that help us think about what it would take to catalyze similar movements in, in, in countries across Africa, I think that may be something that's really worth doing. And that is in some ways what we are trying to do through this Global Energy Alliance for people mm -hmm. in planet, to create a network for learning and for companies. And in fact, you're now seeing some companies from India actually enter the distributed renewable electrification space in West Africa, for example, which is really interesting sort of South-South business collaboration, which I think is exciting. Uh, th thank you, Ashvin. And, and I have to say, you know, I, I also work on certain projects in East Africa, and I think that it's one thing to, um, one of the, I mean, mostly in tourism, but one, most of the thing is that, is what we say is that you have to focus on local capacity building and local innovation. And perhaps one one thing that we can learn is to see that, you know, there's this can-do spirit that, that Indian entrepreneurs and businesses have, and it's that sense of there's no hiccup. And I guess we have it in Nigeria as well. One thing I would say that we can learn in Nigeria is that systems approach of also working with others so that there's an aggregation that also happens in terms of local knowledge, right? As opposed to a lot of the time, I think we're quite good with working with the global north and working with organizations and institutions, but not also within ourselves and our networks. And that's an avenue that we can learn from. So thank you so much, Ashrid, for that. And I guess we have a final minute. <laughs> Ash, um, Agatha, could you just say your closing statement, which is, like I mentioned, one thing you think we can learn. Um, and I guess the question to you is from your sector, one thing we can learn from your sector that we can apply to other sectors, looking now at not necessarily tourism. I've really tried very hard not to mention tourism at all until now and this in this um, panel session, but from the energy sector to perhaps agriculture, um, health, et cetera. So one thing we can learn, you have learned. First, I make a confession. I'm with you on the tourism part. That uh, was a <laughs> fantastic. Okay. So I would say we need to do a lot of research to find sustainable solutions for our environment. And we need to engage with, again, our youths, as well as those that have financed similar solutions in the developed, uh, in the developed countries, um, as well as uh, the key stakeholders like the uh, multilaterals. Their role in making change uh, feasible cannot be uh, overstated. So let's focus on finding a solution that is localized, customized, and will be part of um, the lives, of changing the lives of the people that I, I would like to see happen. Thank you. And there's a lot that we can do. And, and I've been seeing comments in the chat box and most of it is ideas. And basically when you have an idea, like what Ashvin has said, how can we move that idea to action? So thank you so much to my distinguished panelists. I've enjoyed this time. Like I said, our challenge will be to keep to time, but I think we've really tried and we've managed to do this. So over back to um, 
Sustainability Center. And can we just give them a round of applause? I know you can't do that audibly, but if you can just give them a round of applause for being such a stellar panel. Thank you. Thank you very much to our amazing panelists and to our amazing panel moderator. I wish they could hear the round of applause because they really deserve it. They've, they've really responded very well to the quality questions and their responses go a long way to tell the quality of work they do. Wow, that was really insightful and educating. I cannot begin to break down the detail. It was a crash course indeed. Thank you very much, Tendai, Matika, Agatha, Naji, Ashin, Dayal, and our very own faculty here in Lagos Business School, Dr. Adun Okupe. Thank you. Before we delve into the panel session, we were supposed to play a short video, but we're having technical difficulties, and I trust that that has been sorted now. But before we come to the video, we will have a trivia poll to test our knowledge around the SDGs, around the Sustainable Development Goals, which we know it's, uh, it's, it's, it's um, going to be a very easy one for us. But um, I think that's, that's already up on our screen. We will just quickly respond to it. And while we're responding to that, we also want to let um, appreciate everyone for being on time so far from the time allotted to everyone. We can see that uh, we're still we are still around our time schedule. And we want to encourage everyone that will be speaking or that will be participating in the meeting to also ad adhere to the time allotted to them. We also have another very interesting presentation coming up, best practice case presentation, and we know that um, they are ready for us, but that will be right after the, vi the video, which would be addressing resilient systems in the face of climate and social change. The trivia poll has just three questions, and I trust that um, we are we are already done with that. It has just three questions, and I trust that we're already done with that. So when we're done, I think in another 30, 20 seconds, the, the video would pop up on our screens. The word resilience mean? In the energy sector, it's probably one of the most important concepts to consider today. New physical, financial and virtual risks opposing ever greater threats to the energy sector. Will it withstand the pressures or will it break? We need resilience. The demand for secure, affordable and environmentally sustainable energy is growing. But these demands place strain on energy infrastructure, resources and financing, especially now when energy policies and technologies are in transition across the globe. The decisions and investments made today will lock us into our energy future for the next 20 to 30 years. To ensure resilience, energy infrastructure must be designed and built not only stronger, but smarter. To do this, the World Energy Council and their partners have identified three crucial areas of emerging risk that we must address. Firstly, extreme weather. Frequent and severe weather events can impact on infrastructure. Transmission and distribution networks can be seriously damaged by storms or hurricanes. Hydropower generation can be impacted with droughts and changing rainfall patterns. The rise in global average temperatures is stimulating more of these occurrences every year and even creating a greater need for energy to combat the intense heat and cold. Another key risk is the energy water food nexus. After agriculture, energy is the most water-intensive sector. 98% of electricity supply critically depends on the availability of water. The interdependencies and sometimes competing demands between water usage and the production of energy and food triggers great challenges. 
disruptions to the nexus can impact the stability of energy supply and demand for years or decades. The third key area of risk is cyber threat. The digitization of the energy sector has resulted in a massive development of new methods and enhanced abilities to share data, improve management, and increase efficiencies. With this comes increased vulnerabilities. It changes the risk profile of energy systems, which will impact on financial requirements. And sophisticated cyber attacks have already led to some of the first real incidents disrupting energy systems. As our energy sector catapults forward, changing and morphing in its complexity, meeting a greater energy demand while being more and more vulnerable, understanding and improving resilience is one of the few ways we can be better prepared. To increase resilience, the World Energy Council and its partners recommend seven actions are taken. Key recommendations include finding creative financing solutions, such as attracting investments from a more diverse group of investors and understanding risk transfer with tailored instruments such as weather derivatives and cyber insurance. In a legal framework that clearly defines the required levels of resilience for energy infrastructure. Taking action will reduce exposure, unlock capital, and ultimately cut costs, ensuring the resilience of tomorrow's energy systems to the greatest benefit of all. In an increasingly financially constrained world, focusing on resilient energy infrastructure makes business and political sense. It is no longer an option. It is a must. Find out more at worldenergy.org forward slash publications. Positive change and sustainable growth are within our reach. At IHS Towers, our mantra is simple. Better connections mean better opportunities. We provide a critical communications tower infrastructure that enables millions of people across emerging markets to stay connected. We champion economic growth and social development. We're generating long-term impact through targeted sustainability programs. We harness the power of connectivity to deliver real change. Sustainability is in our DNA. Sustainability is fundamental to IHS. In its simplest form, our business model is inherently sustainable through our promotion of infrastructure sharing. IHS Towers facilitates connectivity. Consider the opportunities for a small village in Nigeria or Cameroon or even Brazil once it has digital connectivity. Healthcare, employment and education all now within reach. Nigeria is where the IHS story began and we are privileged to have played a part in its economic development through the provision of mobile connectivity. Although IHS has only been operational in Latin America since 2020, growth has been rapid and sustainability top of the agenda since day one. The programs and initiatives delivered in Africa had a significant impact and socio-economic uplift on their local communities. And I'm proud to emulate this for our local communities here in Brazil. Our communities are integral and we are building our network of partners to deliver real change for their benefit. It's a fantastic privilege for us here at UNICEF to work with IHS here in Nigeria. We are trying to ensure that child rights is part and parcel of those communities and how we work together is to see if we can get community to community connectivity and then obviously school to school connectivity as well. Whether it's mitigating the effects of climate change, giving everyone access to clean water or ensuring that no child is forced to go to work instead of going to school, there's so much more we need to do to create a sustainable global economy. 
have a critical role to play in addressing these problems. That's why in the late 1990s, we pioneered Okay, thank you very much to the technical and media team for putting those videos together. That tells a bit of the story of what some of our partners are doing. Thank you very much. As we can see on our screen right there, is the result of the poll. <laughs> there were three questions, and this is exactly how we responded to them. And you can see the correct answers. Well, we know that most of these goals are interconnected. Most of them are very, very much related. So I wouldn't say we are completely wrong or completely right. So thank you very much. We will quickly delve into another very interesting presentation session. And this, this is a, a best practice case presentation by IHS Towers and um, the project that they're on with, that they'll be telling us about is their project green. The best practice case presentation will be addressing resilient, resilient systems, resilient systems building in practice. And the presenter, the speaker is the principal specialist, green energy management, IHS, Nigeria Limited. And with a warm round of applause, let's make welcome Gait Al Hassan. Over to you, Gait Al Hassan. Thank you for the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope my voice is clear. So, can you hear me? My voice is clear, right? Yes, it's clear, no, loud and clear. Okay, let me share my screen quickly. All right. So, uh, okay. All right, so my name is Laysan Hassan. I've actually been given the privilege uh, to be part of the design team who designed the Project Green for IHS. And uh, that's why I'm so passionate about it as well. So you will see me, you will see me smiling actually a lot during the presentation. Uh, so IHS, uh, again, as, as the intro uh, mentioned in the intro, IHS actually is a telecom infrastructure company we operate close to 39,000 towers across 11 countries. We, when, when talking about sustainability, we, 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 we actually naturally, we, we, we have uh, our core business model actually is inevitably uh, sustainable that we deliver shared infrastructure in emerged markets where we improve uh, the life of the communities, we, we promote uh, inclusion, we promote uh, connectivity, so we are really sustainable by, by, by nature organically. And to also, also for, for Nigeria being our biggest market, we have, we operate 16,500 uh, sites in Nigeria alone, so we believe uh, we have a big responsibility and we believe that we, we, we don't want to be only part of the problem. We all need to create a solution. So we've introduced the, the project green. So just to give a quick uh, overview on the agenda, we'll talk about the IHS core values, the reduction in carbon footprint roadmap, project green initiatives, then sourcing and strategy. Then we can end up conclude with the Q&A session. So just to reiterate again on, on IHS uh, core values, uh, we, major, we mainly have the customer focus, innovation, integrity, boldness, and to recognize its importance also, we recently and happily added the sustainability to the mix uh, for, the, for the values that drive our business. 
Project Green and where the journey continues. Um, so basically, Project Green is really about uh, it's, it's it's a power project where we are intending to replace or optimize uh, our power sources uh, in a more greener manner. Our future outlook is to reduce 50% of our carbon footprint. And let me just take a step back. Uh, so basically, we are really not new. This is not really new to IHS. Uh, back in 2016, uh, we last made our significant investment in hybrid solution where we upgraded over 9,000 9, towers in Nigeria. We were able to reduce our diesel consumption by 50%. But we felt that that's enough. And what we are trying here to do differently because also back then in 2016, we were a bit actually constrained with the technology itself. We can, like the, for example, the solar, the, the solar panels, we were limited with the, the capacity of 250 watts back then because that was how the technology, now the, that the technology improved, we are also now intending to upgrade those existing systems in, in, the, in, in place. And we are also introducing more solar to the mix. We are also now trying to promote the grid connectivity, lithium ion battery storages. So our, our, our roadmap actually as seen on this slide, we are really intending in, in nine years from now, uh, by 2030 to reduce 50% of our again footprint, uh, carbon footprint. Currently, just to give an idea on our benchmark, we today IHS uh, consume across the 16,500 sites, uh, around 26.5 million uh, liters of diesel on monthly basis. And that's a big responsibility. And that's also despite the challenge, uh, the, the, the project that we've run and in 2016, we still have this big volume of diesel in place. So the Project Green mainly is, is intending to impact close to 12,000 sites across, again, all Nigeria states. Uh, we are intending to reduce 250,000 tons of uh, carbon on annual basis and 112 million liters of diesel. Again, we, we, we started actually this year, uh, early this year, we have started the project and we are so aggressive about our, our plans. Uh, as I speak today, for example, for the grid connectivity, we have, we have close to 1,000 locations already connected on grid. We have placed all orders for, for the solar, for the lithium ion. So we are really so serious and aggressive about this uh, plan. And here we go, we have uh, the, 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 the solutions that now we are introducing. And again, to, to talk about the resilience, uh, as Mr. I think Shabi also mentioned, yes, today, uh, and, and a part of our business model, we have diesel generators operating. So yes, we have resilience in the system, but that's not the resilience that definitely we are looking for. Uh, we are promoting a more greener resilience in this project. So that's we've introduced those actually initiatives, uh, starting with, again, enhancing the grid connectivity uh, and, and increasing the, 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 the number of sites connected to the national grid. And we are really, uh, what we are doing, doing differently, again, here for the grid, for example, project, uh, we are trying to collaborate, collaborate with the distribution companies and, and invest in the last mile infrastructure to enhance and optimize also the distribution network for us to be connected and hooked up to that grid. Uh, again, as I speak, 1,000 sites already, as I speak today, connected to grid with an average uh, generator hour reduction of 12. So again, we have the lithium ion battery storages, we have the super cap hybrid, we have gas generators, and we have uh, the solar systems also that we are now introducing or replacing existing ones with the more and the higher capacity ones. So we might also, again, it's, it's worth actually noting that many of these sites might, might end up having a mix of these solutions. And that's really, the, that's really the resilience that we are trying to promote. So in case of absence of grid, we will have solar there, we will have lithium ion there. 
and 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 so all in all we, we are trying as much as possible to eliminate actually the diesel from the system so uh for, for the short term now for the short term we are trying to to to, to limit the, the 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 technologies to the tested ones to the low hanging fruit to the quick wins then you can see also on the midterm and long term we are really trying to be innovative we are really trying to to think how also uh, we can we can do things differently and that's why we started also discussing about the solar farm wind farm because also we know that when we talk about solar we we, 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 we first thing comes to mind is the space do we have enough space to accommodate so in our short term project, we are trying yes to exploit that space as much as possible and design a system that can fit. Then on the long term, we are also now thinking, why don't we go outside that site and also explore a uh, possibility of, of, of deploying solar mini grid, for example, or wind mini grid. And uh, lastly, on the and and, and here uh, on on this slide is the sorting strategy. And I really want to talk again about the the the, the amount of uh, materials involved. I just reflect on the on the size of this project. So 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 right now, as I speak, also we have placed orders for around thirty eight megawatt uh, solar capacity. Uh, it's it's around sixty nine thousand panels. Also, around 82 megawatt hour storage capacity. All orders have been placed, and uh, and 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 to mitigate, we are really taking some measures to mitigate also the uh, the delays in the supply chain. Uh, so 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 to, to be able actually to meet up with our targets. So we are so we are splitting over multiple suppliers. Uh, we are trying to place the orders as I as I said four to eight months ahead. And, and again, uh, here as, as, as a concluding point, uh, in, in emerging markets, actually, there is, there is no way we become of a scale unless we operate a long-term sustainable business. We really believe there are tremendous opportunities out there and solutions that can be adopted. And while we have been really investing in renewable solutions for many years, the scale and the scope of Project Green and investment represent our continued high degree commitment for focusing on sustainability and resilience across our business here in IHS. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I believe um, some people would have some questions. So if you have a question, do well to raise up your hand using the, the hand emoji. Just, just put that in the chat column. If you also want to type it, you can type the question. And please, let's, let's be quick with that so Mr. Gait al Hassan can do justice to our questions because his presentation was great and I believe there will be will need more insight to certain things. So if you do kindly reach out to him by putting out your questions. Our second best practice case presentation would not be taken because the presenters are absent. So we'll just use that time to, to address some questions that we think we need more insights to. So if you have a question, do well to raise up your hand and Mr. Guide Al Hassan is here to do more than justice to your questions. It's also it's also may uh, worth also to mention that our our earnings uh, the, the whoever is actually in, is interested in more details all these actually figures and, and the project plan itself is available on our website and on our quarterly earning releases also we're gonna actually disclose the the the, the savings and and on annual basis also we're going to disclose the GHG emission reduction. Uh, 
So whoever is interested in getting updates, actually we will be disclosing this publicly. Okay, thank you very much, guys, Al Hassan, which means that if you need more light to the presentation, you can find it there. Okay, I think a hand is up. A hand is up. Okay, over to you. Let's, let's hear your question. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, um, uh, Gus. I think my question now specifically, so I'm here in Malawi and I work for Old Nature. And um, I, I, I was quite interested, um, most especially when you talked uh, about how you, um, you're able to bring in your, when you're doing your procurement, you're able to, to embed uh, the issues that you want uh, your suppliers to take into consideration. So my question now from, uh, from where I'm sitting, uh, I think I put two for you, is how um, now I'm looking at monitoring and evaluation because you're sitting uh, in your organization, but then to make sure or to get, to take the accountability that the suppliers are indeed uh, adhering to the standards that you are looking for uh, in terms of, uh, in as far as sustainability is focusing, how are you tracking that? The second question, um, so just recently, uh, our, our, our country has just signed uh, an agreement on carbon credits. So we just, um, now this is uh, just out of interest to say how based, uh, for example, for private sector like us, can we take advantage of that uh, kind of agreement uh, and get ourselves involved? Now from our sustainability work and our embedding ourselves in this agreement that the government signed uh, with the government of Switzerland, uh, that is to say if, for example, uh, something like that is already happening in your country. Yeah, thank you. So can I answer that, right? Uh, so I, I, I was able to hear clearly the, the first question. I think I struggled to hear the second question. I think the, 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 it was a bit, you know, uh, disconnecting. But again, let me answer the first question about the, the, the risk uh, of quality. Uh, and and that, that's a good question, actually. And that's part of, part of actually of the measures that we are taking uh, that reduce the overall risk by we are just really using suppliers with a very robust track record, right? Again, these technologies are there uh, for a long time. It does that by now, I mean the capacities of these technologies are enhanced. Most of these materials are now commoditized. So, so uh, like when, when I talk about solar panels, when I talk about lithium ion storages, uh, we are really dealing with a very big suppliers uh, in the market and they are pioneers. Uh, and, and I think that's that's what really ensure uh, the, 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 I will address actually the, the, the concern that you raised. And again, to reiterate, IHS has done similar project in 2016, which gave us a true experience, end-to-end uh, -end experience when it comes to the supply chain, when it comes to the implementation, when it comes to the planning even. So we've really, uh, we've really, uh, put through all these, I mean, experiences that, that we've gained uh, into this project as well to mitigate actually all and we be proactive as much as possible. For the second question, I, I really struggled to hear the question. I'm not sure if, if the moderator can please uh, reiterate on the question. Okay, I think uh, she can take the question again and be more audible so Mr. Gait Al Hassan can hear you clearly. Thank you. I don't know if this is audible enough. Yes, it is right now. Yes. Awesome, and thanks for the first question. So the second question specifically is on the carbon credit. Uh, that is to say, is there anything that you're doing uh, maybe from where you're sitting in your country? Um, I'm just trying to now ask him, um, being in Malawi, we've just entered in, and now this is from a government point of view that uh, the government has just signed an agreement uh, with uh, the, uh, Switzerland and uh, the agreement is on the carbon credit. So are there any opportunities that private sector companies, for example, Old Nature, if they're championing sustainability and climate change issues, that they could take advantage of this uh, carbon credit agreement that has just come through? And if, if, if there are opportunities, what kind of insights can you give uh, if that is, uh, is something that you do uh, uh, or track uh, from your country? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, now I got the question. So, so, so for the carbon credit, really, uh, 
although yes definitely we track this uh our group actually uh track this uh delicately uh we right now as i speak we still uh we, we we really haven't really discussed whether these credits will be sold or whether they'll be retained uh but yes to answer the question yes we track this uh definitely it's part of even our reporting obligations uh but again there is no yet any decision toward what would be the action taken uh on the credits uh the the old focus at this stage as well on the design on, on the implementation and even getting actually this uh this volume of co2 really reduced genuinely okay thank you very much mr guides al hassan i think we have another question in the chat column and that's from Ahmed James. He says, he asks, how does access to internet help in the fight for climate change? How does access to internet help in the fight for climate change? Okay. Uh, perhaps I didn't quite get the question well. Uh, can, can you please rephrase the question? Perhaps I didn't get your point. The question is, how does access to internet help in the, in the fight for climate change? How does access to internet? So, so access to internet, again, it's, it's, it's similar to the, to the concept of the, of, the, of the mobile phone, because once, okay, it's, it promotes sustainability through, through the interconnectivity for sure, and through, through inclusion. But how this affect the climate change? I'm not sure. Perhaps I can relate. Uh, perhaps uh, I don't know if, if anyone of the audience also might have an idea on this question. Okay. I think on that note, we would um, say a very big thank you to Mr. Gait Al Hassan and. You can see every everyone really did appreciate your presentation. If you check the chat column, you see all the comments and commendations there. Thank you very much for letting us know your practical carbon reduction plan from short term to medium term and long term. Thank you very much. At this juncture, before we go into the the Thank summary you. of the program, we will we will take a a moment to watch a brief video. I trust the media and technical team is ready. What is it about Africa? Some see struggle, we see opportunity. This is where we thrive. Africa is a land of contrasts. Hundreds of millions of our people live without access to clean water and electricity. Yet we have more entrepreneurs than any other continent. And by 2050, half of the world's youth will be African. Africa's been busy. We're urbanizing, embracing technology. We're sprinting forward with some of the fastest growing economies in the world. It's time for African-driven solutions to African problems. It's time to seize the moment and create our own narrative to build the Africa we want. Business has the power to bring about change at scale and make money doing so. The shared value business model reconnects business success with social progress. Shared value is also about partnerships, building business networks that create inclusive growth. The power of collaboration should never be underestimated. If we can bring together businesses and communities from across Africa with a shared purpose, we can build economic value and most importantly, value for society. It's time for Africa to become the economic powerhouse of the future. Become part of Africa's most powerful shared value business network. Join the Shared Value Africa initiative today. join the shared value the shared network, shared network today thank you very much for that so right now we'll move into the summary of learning we've learned a lot from far and wide but to put everything into a nutshell we have 
the chief executive officer of Shared Value Africa Initiative to do justice to that. With a warm round of applause, let's make welcome Tiki Bernard. Over to you, Tiki Bernard. Thank you. Thank you, Kenan, for that. And uh, I'm really feeling enormously privileged to be here today. And, and thank you to Lagos Business School and Prof. Chris and team. And what a privilege to be at the 8th International Sustainability Summit and just to listen for almost four hours to such encouraging and inspiring thought leadership um, that was shared with us and how we can build resilience to create sustainability. So we, as the shared value implementers and practitioners, believe that Africa is where we're building the global future. And it's our responsibility as leaders, as individuals, as organizations operating on this beautiful continent of ours to create prosperity for all. So the science of resilience focus on the ability to develop in the face of growing, as um, Rodney was saying, growing turbulence, uncertainty, volatility, and ambiguity. We need to develop persistence and adaptability to innovate and transform with resilience thinking at the heart of what we do. For too long, we've assumed that nature is separate from society when in fact, Ecosystems provide the basis for social and economic progress and stability. And just looking back at what happened in the last year coming off COVID, COVID the Ukraine-Russia war, three UK prime ministers in two months, floods in Pakistan that affected 33 million people, estimated to cost 40 billion US dollars and back home here in the Horn of Africa, the drought crisis is causing major food insecurities. And there's so many more examples. So truly, we currently live in a world that is struggling and that desperately needs resilience thinking to deal with all the crises and let's, and, and we need to commit to each other that we will never give up and continue to build back better. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me that there were many learnings today, but I just wanna share some of them because as everybody was talking, I was writing them down. And I, and I want to start off with what Simon was saying. And Simon was, Simon reconfirmed that economic and social resilience are interconnected. You know, and I so agree with, with, with Simon that connect, connectivity is essential for economic development and that financial inclusion is a key driver of economic growth on our beautiful continent. And the Airtel Madagascar case study was a, was a, a clear example of how Airtel um, apply resilience thinking um, to their work. And I'm sure you all agree with me that Rodney's presentation was very, very insightful. And, and, and the fact that he reiterated that we need, need a major system change is what we as shared value advocate all the time. It is about creating equality in the most sustainable way. He also said that, in, and, and, and I think we all know that because we've seen it at COP27, that in spite of knowing that climate change is a major crisis, we're still not accelerating our resilience thinking. In, and what is clear from Rodney's um, address is that we cannot just produce, produce, and consume, consume, because we need to recycle and, and reuse. And Rodney also spoke about this mindset shift and reinventing capitalism, where we reward, and I love this what, about what he said, is where we reward value creation and not value extraction. However, we need the courage and the boldness to make the change we need. And we need to challenge our current thinking. And in order to transform, we need, and I think he had this, this beautiful triangle that he showed to us that we need a mindset shift, we need system thinking, and we need a shared, a shared vision. And, and, and that we also need a form of cap capitalism 
that that pursue true value. So 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 Rodney had an amazing presentation, and I think if you came on late, you must watch the the actual recording. And then I want to say to Adun, Tendai, Agatha, and Aswin, I don't know if I'm going to do justice to what a really informative panel discussion you had. Thank you for focusing on food security and energy, uh, because those are two of, of, of our biggest challenges that we have at the moment on the Africa continent. We need to make energy more accessible, especially to those that are marginalized. And Indai, thanks for reiterating that partnerships are important. Very, very important because without, we cannot do things on our own. We need to collaborate. And, and one of my favorite sayings is that, you know, um, that without collaboration, we cannot secure a sustainable future. Agatha, um, your discussion on 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 this on the on the energy sector and that and and I also agree that you know the security of the energy sector is crucial and we need to design responsible and sustainable energy systems yes we cannot depend on government and I saw Agatha take a deep breath before she spoke about that but but I I I think that we we if we have to wait for government we will not be where we are today. And specifically, Agatha, when I think about your projects that you shared with us. And Aswin, thank you for explaining why we should care about climate change and that the energy system is going to be under enormous strain as we experience the increase of heat and the increase of cold during during the climate change seasons that we and and all of the natural disasters that we're going through so agatha you said if we want a reliable energy system we need partners that is prepared to be with us from a long term perspective we need multi multi stakeholder partnerships to accelerate effective food system and energy supply and it's about collaboration coming back to that again and we need a decentralized climate smart solutions as when your insights that there is uh, there's, there's, a, there's a resilience by design and a resilience by necessity, and that we need to think about system resilience and bring public and private sector together as partnerships are cru crucial. And then, Tendai, thanks for sharing the importance of reporting and measurement. And Adun, I loved your likening uh, of reporting to storytelling as that, and that we mustn't overcomplicate it. And yes, Agatha, governments sometimes do not adhere to the commitments that they make to us. And in the absence of that, we need resilient investors. We need educated multilateral organizations that understand the challenges. We need multi-sectoral solutions to address food security, energy, and health. And I just want to say thanks again to all four of you for such an insightful panel discussion. I could have listened to you the whole day. And lastly, I agree that we need to support our young innovators and entrepreneurs to create a, a sustainable future. So when I looked at, 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 um, at the case study from IHS Nigeria Geert, and thank you for that. I think we need more organizations, uh, you know, that that can show others and be the leaders on how to re reduce their carbon footprint. I mean, I was astounded when you mentioned that you use 26.5 million liters of diesel per month. Must be quite a headache when the, the diesel supplies are short. So, so the resilience thinking towards sustainability is clear in your short-term and your mid-term and long-term goals, as, as well as your procurement and your procurement strategy. And um, I just want to say thanks again to, to, to um, 
to Strat, I mean, to to Lagos Business School for inviting me to to just come and recap on what I've learned today from everybody that was on this particular session. And I'm going to hand back to you, Canon, and thank you very much for everything. Thank you very much, Tiki Bernard, for that detailed summary of work. Thank you very much. A round of applause to her. So it's been a really insightful session indeed. Some, some of the presentations had chills running down, down my spine. Some of them had me having goose, goosebumps. But in all, it's been really insightful and a lot to take away. My, my notes are really, really full, and I trust, trust it's the same case with you all. Well, I know most definitely I'll come back and I'll watch this video again, and I want to implore you all to do the same. At this point, at this juncture, we'll call on our very own head of sustainability in Lagos Business School Sustainability Center, Oreva Atania, to give us the closing remark and vote of thanks. Over to you, Oreva. Wow, thank you very much, Canon. Thank you, everyone. Um, I mean, I'm blown away. I also learned a whole lot from our dialogue today. Uh, so for some of us who joined in after we opened, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for logging on and staying on and engaging with us today at the LBS International Sustainability Conference. Since this critical dialogue commenced a few hours ago, you know, we've learned a lot from the guest presentations to the keynote address to the case presentations and that very powerful and insightful panel discussion. So I believe that we've all been equipped with the right information as far as this topic of resilient systems is concerned. For this um, dialogue, we focused on just food systems and energy systems because of how critical they are. But no matter the sector that you work in, whether you're in for-profit, non-profit, development, or even on the public policy and government side of things, we believe that you can use this knowledge to influence some of the outcomes around your work, and we hope that you've taken a thing or two out of your hours spent with us today. Uh, for us at Lagos Business School, our priority when doing this is to really facilitate engagements that will always be worthwhile for you because we get to inform and inspire you to make a difference in your organizations through your priorities and throughout your own journey. Like we know that sustainability is a journey. So, uh, I want to close by thanking you all for being an amazing and engaging audience, even virtually, joining us from so many countries and so many locations. We really, really do appreciate you. We appreciate the comments, the commendations, the messages. Uh, we really, It really gives us the encouragement that this was a worthwhile venture. Thank you so much to all our speakers joining us, preparing and preparing for this short time, but I know the preparation has been a lot. Thank you very much to our co-conveners, GRI, the Global Reports Initiative Africa Office, IHS Nigeria Limited, Shared Value Africa Initiative. Thank you so much, Tiki. You tied that beautifully together. We wouldn't have been able to do this without you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. And also I want to say a very big thank you to the entire LBS community and especially a team of people who, uh, I, I don't know how to describe them. They are so amazing and they are the ones that make all this happen. Um, the LBS Sustainability Center team. And I actually want to request that you guys put on your videos. I know they haven't seen you all day. So please, can you put on your videos, Sustainability Center team? I would like our audience to see you know the, the faces behind this. So yes, that is Nemeka Osanua, Theresa, Chineme, Anthony, everyone doing all this hard work to make this forum a success. Thank you so much for all your work. I think they should hear your voices. You probably say something, don't just smile. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, I, I, I understand why they're not putting on, on their mics because of the sound feedback, but thank you. Thank you all so much. So we really do appreciate you all for staying on with us. 
thank you for staying on this to this end. Like there are so many people still logged on. Um, we really, really do appreciate you. Um, the contact information for our center for LBS will be available in the chat box. Please get in touch with us and stay in tune with us. We'll send, we have a monthly newsletter that you can subscribe to um, and keep in touch with us and learn with us as we go on this journey together. Thank you so much. You made your feedback is really, really appreciated. And we definitely look forward to hosting you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And that's been my time as your moderator. Yes, and thank you, Canon, for the <laughs> excellent moderation. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you thank very you. much, Areva, for having me. Yes, thank you so thank much, you. everyone. We have some information and videos that still play for you. So if you do have some time, please stay logged on. Um, you'll still be very well entertained. Thank you very much, all our speakers who are still logged on. I'm so grateful. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Whether it's mitigating the effects of climate change, giving everyone access to clean water or ensuring that no child is forced to go to work instead of going to school, there's so much more we need to do to create a sustainable global economy. At GRI, we believe companies and other organizations have a critical role to play in addressing these problems. That's why in the late 1990s, we pioneered sustainability reporting. Sustainability reporting is an organization's practice of publicly disclosing its broader economic, environmental, and social impacts. The GRI sustainability reporting standards are the first global standards for sustainability reporting. They feature disclosures on a wide range of topics, such as energy use, diversity in the workplace, anti-corruption, and human rights, to name only a few. As a result, any organization can use the GRI standards to increase transparency with all of their stakeholders. This is the first step in transforming our global economy into one that's sustainable and inclusive. Reporting with the GRI standards can help you protect the environment and improve society while thriving economically. What's more, sustainability reporting can create a range of benefits for your organization, helping you improve stakeholder relations, enhance your reputation, and build trust. At GRI, we also offer engagement opportunities that can enhance those benefits. We support organizations throughout their reporting journeys. We set up training programs that explain how to establish a sustainability reporting process, and we offer services that help ensure reports are aligned with the GRI standards. Organizations can also join the GRI Gold community and connect with peers to develop solutions to shared challenges. And GRI also works with governments to promote smart sustainability policies and regulations around the world. For example, you can use GRI standards to show your contributions to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and to fulfill your reporting requirements under the EU Directive on Non-Financial Reporting. We also offer guidance on the alignment between GRI standards and other reporting efforts and international norms. So when you choose to use GRI standards, you're joining a global effort to contribute to sustainable development. At GRI, we're working towards a future where all organizations use transparency to transform our world into one where we create wealth for everyone while preserving the resources that drive our economies. Help us make this vision a reality. Positive change and sustainable growth are within our reach. At IHS Towers, our mantra is simple. Better connections mean better opportunities. We provide a critical communications tower infrastructure that enables millions of people across emerging markets to stay connected. We champion economic growth and social development. We're generating long-term impact through targeted sustainability programs. 
we harness the power of connectivity to deliver real change. Sustainability is in our DNA. Sustainability is fundamental to IHS. In its simplest form, our business model is inherently sustainable through our promotion of infrastructure sharing. IHS Towers facilitates connectivity. Consider the opportunities for a small village in Nigeria or Cameroon or even Brazil once it has digital connectivity. Healthcare, employment and education all now within reach. Nigeria is where the IHS story began and we are privileged to have played a part in its economic development through the provision of mobile connectivity. Although IHS has only been operational in Latin America since 2020, growth has been rapid and sustainability top of the agenda since day one. The programs and initiatives delivered in Africa had a significant impact and socio-economic uplift on their local communities. And I'm proud to emulate this for our local communities here in Brazil. Our communities are integral and we are building our network of partners to deliver real change for their benefit. It's a fantastic privilege for us here at UNICEF to work with IHS here in Nigeria. We are trying to ensure that child rights is part and parcel of those communities and how we work together is to see if we can get community to community connectivity and then obviously school to school connectivity as well. Well, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome you to the International Sustainability Conference. Today, I was asked to come and share what the company is doing in the space of sustainability when it comes to plastic, recycling, and so forth. And the goal was to highlight three things. So number one, you would have to consider the waste that's already currently in our environment. Number two was uh, sharing the company's circularity strategy about how we envision the waste coming in the future. And on the three, how we partner with others. Well, we all know that SME is a bedrock of the economy. So if we don't have sustainable and affordable electricity for even the SMEs, we will have huge energy poverty in the country. Sustainability is the way forward. You know, and that's a way to really protect our planet from the projected catastrophic effect of the climate and the planet. It's been an interesting conference because the topic innovation is something that most people, uh, we talk about it, but we don't actually know what it means for many people. But to come to a conference whereby the practicalities of innovation and sustainability are really addressed by professionals in their field, with very clear examples, it's actually quite important. In the panel I chaired, you know, when we talked about creating a sustainable business model to combat and end poverty, absolutely, it's a, way, it's a way to go because a lot of business models have been tested in the market and they're working. So the next thing is how do we then scale? That's the way I see us tackling poverty in Nigeria and to position Nigeria as one of the leading African countries. We want to be able to see how companies who are operating here can focus on the bottom of the pyramid, but actually realizing that by sustainability effectively in that sector, you can still grow the business and make money. The conference is really a, an opportunity for, in, for people involved in sustainability across the spectrum to come together, to um, network, to pick up new ideas of how to drive sustainability in our world today. Well, thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. We're very grateful to the partner for this forum, Dow Chemicals, for supporting LBS Sustainability Center. To all our speakers and panelists for joining us today, even traveling from far distances, we're very grateful to you.